So good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the March 12th meeting of the, excuse me, the March 21st meeting of the uh, Arlington Redevelopment Board. <coughs> this open meeting is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the COVID-19 virus. For this meeting, <coughs> excuse me, the ARB is convening uh, remotely via Zoom, as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So at this point, I'd like to um, <coughs> take a roll call and confirm that all members of the board are present and can hear me, starting with Kim Lau. Uh, present. Uh, Jean Benson. Present. Melissa Tintakoulis. Melissa. Present. Thank you. Steve Rebelak. Good evening, Madam Chair. And I am Rachel Zemberry, the chair of the Redevelopment Board. Uh, we also have two members of the Department of Planning and Community Development with us this evening, Jennifer Raitt. Present. And Kelly Lydema. Present. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so this evening is the third night of public hearings for the Warren Articles proposed for the 2022 Springtown meeting. There are uh, four nights of hearings for 18 articles. Consistent with the past night's hearings, the ARB tonight will be hearing from applicants and the public wishing to speak on each of the articles as scheduled. The board will pose any questions to the applicants, but will reserve discussion and voting on each article to recommend action or no action until after all hearings are completed on April 4th. Typical for each art, typically for each article, um, we will hear from the department first regarding the memo that they have prepared, followed by up to a six minute presentation by the petitioners. We will then take questions from the board, followed by public comments. We will then ask the petitioner to address any questions and take final comments from board members. So before we uh, begin agenda item number one, which is the continued public hearings for 2022 to annual town meeting, I'd just like to run through the, um, the procedures that we follow as part of the public hearings. So first, the scope of this public hearing is the subject matter that was posted in the agenda for this evening. Any person wishing to address the ARB on the subject matter of the agenda shall signify your desire to speak by raising your hand through the, uh, through the raised hand function in the participants uh, button at the bottom of Zoom. When I announce that consideration for, for public, um, when it's time for uh, public participation. After being recognized to speak, each person will preface their comments by giving their first and last name and street address. Each person addressing the board on the subject matter of the agenda shall limit their remarks to three minutes. You will only be allowed to speak at the, again at the uh, discretion of the chair for each particular article. The board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Everyone present at the public hearing is requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made. And that includes using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, hearing all participants shall refrain from, uh, excuse me, participants shall refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil and courteous manner. Speakers should address all other questions through me as the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in the debate or dialogue with ARB uh, members or other participants. Questions may or may not be answered during the hearing and will be addressed at the discretion of the chair. Often I will take questions as they are posed and uh, group them together for, uh, for the petitioner to address as a group. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and move into agenda item number one, which is the continued public hearing. And we will start this evening with Article 45, which is a zoning bylaw amendment related to appeals. This article was inserted by the request of uh, Sophie 
um, Migliazzo and 10 registered voters. At this point, I'd like to first turn this over to Jenny Raitt uh, to see if she or Kelly have any uh, highlights that they'd like to cover from the memo that was prepared by the Department of Community uh, Planning and Community Development. Good evening, Rachel. Um, Jenny Ray, Director of Planning and Community Development. I don't have anything in addition to add to what was briefly stated in the memo, which is that we we feel that this the bylaw already constructively covers this matter, and we're not we're though we're not certain exactly what the petitioner is trying to achieve, and so we'll look forward to the presentation this evening with uh, perhaps Mark and Sophie. More one of them. Um, I see Mark here. Um, in order to understand that a little bit better, and then be able to be, maybe be able to provide additional feedback. But from based upon what we understand, we believe that this is constructively covered under the existing zoning bylaw and allowed under state law. Great, thank you, Jenny. Uh, so is Sophie uh, Migliazzo with us this evening? She unfortunately is not, but has asked me to um, stand under stat. I am one of the Red, 10 registered voters who supported the, the article and uh, her absence is due to her being a committee member of another committee for the town that is meeting this evening in preparation for the town meeting. Great, thank you very much. So if you could <clears throat> please introduce yourself by your first, last name and address, um, I would uh, love to hear your presentation. Uh, just note that you'll have up to six minutes to make your presentation and then we will take uh, questions and comments from the board. So please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the members of the Arlington Redevelopment Board and to the staff of the um, Planning and Community Development who are present here tonight and have um, already begun considering the proposed warrant. My name is Mark Miazzo, 175 Pleasant Street. I'm the spouse of um, Sophie Miazzo, who's proposed the um, the warrant article in question. I think the you know the thrust of uh, the proposals, which uh, are actually quite surgical um, in terms of uh, adding just a few words and phrases to section three of the existing zoning bylaw, um, have a single purpose in mind, and that is to clarify at what point parties um, may seek review of a complaint that they might have filed with the um, Department of Special Services. Uh, in cases where they feel like uh, enforcement is is lagging. Now, it, it is true that there is some language both in, in the bylaw and uh, in the underlying um, statute that speak to appeals. Um, and specifically, there's, there's some quite um, exact guidance given as to when the building inspector is to um, respond to a complaint that's been filed, namely within 14 days with a response as to whether or not um, the building inspector feels like a complaint has merits or whether there's a, a violation that exists. However, there's there's no further guidance in terms of timing as to what should happen and when. And um, this is, I think, leads to some confusion in circumstances where the building inspector does not deny the complaint, where, where the building inspector affirms or is silent as to whether a violation exists. Um, and uh, and doesn't take, um, let's say, immediate action to uh, to address the, the the purported or the alleged um, violation of the zoning bylaw. So I, th I think the the spirit of the zoning bylaw is that at a appropriate point in time that um, a complainant feels like if he or she feels like that complaint is not being acted upon should have some sort of recourse to the Zoning Board of Appeals. But there's very little context, almost none in fact, in the zoning bylaw as to when that time is ripe or when, when that matter would be ripe for appeal. And as a result, I think we're doing a bit of <laughs> disservice to both um, uh, parties, people that live in, in town that, would, um, that, that are bringing complaints under the bylaw, but also a disservice to uh, the esteemed members of the Board of Zoning Appeal who themselves are sort of thrust into an awkward position of trying to decide when or not a matter is right, in fact, for the review, since there's no guidance in, in the bylaws that stands today. I've, um, I, I've had the occasion to speak to several, uh, several attorneys who are specialized in this area. I have no particular expertise in this area, 
but I have spoken to several attorneys that have expertise in this area, and I've, I've spoken to some past members of the Board of uh, Zoning Appeals, and no one, no one is actually quite sure when it would be appropriate if no enforcement action has been taken to, to bring a matter before the board. Um, I certainly don't think it should be the case that there should be some sort of immediate the right to appeal to the to the zoning board. I think the intent of the bylaw is to give the building inspector and his staff um, uh, discretion and ample time to um, to act upon complaints and to address them as they see fit. But I also I don't think it's the intent of the bylaw that things can slip sideways for months or years, um, as is sometimes the case today in Arlington, uh, without effective uh, action being taken in respect to valid complaints. So the proposal that's been put forward is simply to clarify for all parties that refer to the bylaws when it would be appropriate for them to go to the board. And if I'm not quite sure where I am on the time, um, but I, I did want to respond to one last point in the staff memo, if I may. I'm not happy to do so now or later in the question and answer period. Uh, you still have two minutes, so please feel free to go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I noticed that the, the end of the, the memo that was provided um, for your consideration remarks that it, it, this is the last sentence in the memo that you might have in front of you. It says, in the current form, neither the zoning bylaw nor Massachusetts general law preclude a resident from taking civil action against another resident who persists in violating the zoning bylaw. I actually don't think that's that's accurate. I would direct, um, I, I, unfortunately, I, I just received a memo earlier today and I have a chance to submit a presentation for your consideration, but um, I would refer parties to a court case. It was a court of appeals case in Massachusetts that was cited in April of 2020. It's called Belinsky v. Building Commissioner of Douglas. And it goes into, I'd be happy to uh, uh, read relevant portions to the board if you'd like, but, but um, basically what it says is that um, courts do not have jurisdiction as a general matter to, um, to decide complaints of zoning bylaws brought by individuals against other residents of their towns because the statute, um, this would be Massachusetts General Law Chapter uh, 40, um, Section 7, specifically says that, um, that there is exclusive jurisdiction to hear these sorts of matters in front of the, is in the first instance in front, in front of the Board of Zoning Appeals. And then only afterwards could they be brought to a land court upon appeal of a decision made by the Board of Zoning Appeals. So there is no um, equitable or other right of any party to bring uh, a complaint or a matter to the attention of a court or other uh, deliberative body in Massachusetts, except through this initial process, which runs initially to the building inspector and then to the um, to the Board of Zoning Appeal. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And um, we'll direct other questions to you as we receive them from the uh, members of the board. Thank you. Do you have any time left or have I exhausted you, it? You are through your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the members of the uh, ARB for any questions, starting with Ken. Yeah, when I first read this uh, article, I was a little confused because I thought we had this in place already. Um, I, I really thought that the ARB or ZBA, um, the board members, uh, don't enforce. It's the ISD that does the enforcing. And, and that was always pretty clear. You know, we don't set, uh, we, we may do policy, we may, uh, we may do approvals of stuff, but we don't enforce. That's not in our charter. Um, if I'm wrong, then I would like to hear about that. The other thing here is there's one uh, part of this language, I'm not sure it's a part of your thing or it's a part of Jenny's review, was uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, the building inspector is to initiate civil action if they do not have done so to do uh, complaints, the compliance satisfaction. Uh, I, I mean, so whoever's complaining, if they're unsatisfied, that means you're saying they, uh, that the building inspector still has to continue on with his uh, 
uh, initiate a civil, uh, civil action or if the uh, building inspector says this is a compliant, he's already made that determination. He's not there to make the complaint, compliant, uh, maybe I'm saying it wrong, happy. He's making a judgment. And I'm not sure is that um, language they're correct or not. I'm curious to see what my other board members say, but um, I just think this right now is just, uh, um, just um, repetitive right now. And that's my thoughts right now. Thank you, Ken. Jean. Thank you, and thank you. Um, how do you pronounce your last name again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch it, Mr. Migliazzo. Quite all right, it's, it's Miyazzo, but uh, anything close is fine. I don't I think won't. I was very close, I apologize. Um, so thanks. thank you for um, bringing this to us. I do have a couple of questions. If you look at the screen 3.1.2b, it says no later than, and the number of days is absent. Do you have a date, number of days you'd like to insert there? So I, um, we, we proposed the, the language with the blank because I defer to the collective wisdom of, uh, of this body actually to help inform what would be an appropriate number here. The, the only other sort of specific time frame that's referenced in this um, section of the zoning bylaws is in 3.1.2a, which is also on the screen. You can see in the second line there that mm -hmm. within 14 days of the receipt of a request for enforcement of the zoning bylaw, the building inspector shall investigate the facts and um, give written notice to the owner, excuse me, um, and if the building inspector finds evidence of a violation, shall give notice to the owner. Um, so the only time frame is, is 14 days in, in this section. I, I do think that the building inspector ought to have and, and um, you know, should have a reasonable period of time to pursue enforcement if the uh, uh, property owner that, that's uh, maybe the subject to the enforcement action isn't immediately compliant, right? The, the building inspector has ample tools um, to bring, to, to issue fines and to bring both civil and criminal actions against a property holder that is not compliant with the zoning bylaws. And that takes time and I understand that and that's fine. Um, that said, I, I do believe it's the intent, the 14 day period being rather you know, short, uh, shorter than I would have uh, you know, necessarily proposed if I were writing this afresh. Um, I do have the impression that the, the intent here is for the for enforcement to uh, proceed promptly. Um, so I would have thought that um, maybe something in the range of say four to six months, 120 to 180 days would maybe be an appropriate period of time to see whether the building inspector is in fact acting upon a complaint. And if nothing has happened within say that four to six months period of time, then it should at least be, I would have thought, clear for a complainant to, um, to invoke uh, an appeal to the, the Board of Zoning Appeals if nothing's happened in that period of time. I would have thought, say, a year would be too long if nothing's happening. So somewhere between three months and a year, you think, would fit? I, I, I'm willing to hear other people's views for sure. I, I would have proposed four to six months. Yeah, OK, thanks. I'll one of my concerns, other than trying to understand the amount of days that you thought would be appropriate, is, um, so let's say you pick three months. Um, there's notice and demand, but it's going to take six or nine months to come into compliance. You, whatever we put in here, we've set up a situation where you know, some zoning things are fairly easily fixed and some take a lot of time to fix them. So whatever, I, I'm concerned that whatever number of days we put in here, there will be something that takes longer. Um, so that's one concern that I have about this clause altogether. Um, 
The other concern that I have is um, just how much the building inspector can accomplish, how busy the docket is, how much time it would take. And rather than have the priorities be driven by a date that's put in here, the priorities need to be driven by probably health and safety, which I think are the main things that the building inspector is looking for. So if the building inspector needs to balance, oh, I'm gonna miss the date that we've added to B versus I need to do something for health and safety, I want, would want the default to be for health and safety rather than you know, a number that drives something to happen. So I'm, I'm um, very sympathetic to the idea that it makes sense to put a time frame in here. But I think there are really um, countervailing reasons why it might not make sense in this instance. Um, I just wonder. I don't. I don't. I don't have a solution for that, Mark, because I I see where you're coming from, but I, I'm just concerned this sets up a bad dynamic um, by um, doing that. In, and so if you can think of a way around it, that would be great. I'm not sure you can think of it off the top of your head, but you're always welcome to email um, Jenny Rate with suggestions, things like that for how to deal with it. Yeah, if you make it a year, which was like the long end of what you suggested, then maybe that wouldn't be so much of an issue. But you know, at some point I'd like to hear after all my colleagues speak from um, um, the building inspector's office about what they think about this. So let me go down to 3.1.3. Um, why did you add or any other agency or person um, from, you know, right now, if, if I make a complaint for something in the, to the building inspector and I'm okay with what the building inspector has done. Why should somebody else be able to step in, any other agency or person, and um, continue something where I've chosen not to continue something? I, I think I can answer that one relatively directly. Okay. That, that language is meant to track chapter 40A, section eight, which is the uh, mercifully short section mm -hmm. of Massachusetts law that defines the appeals from the granting authority. Um, so it says, if, if you'd like to hear it, I can quickly um, read it or paraphrase it. It says, an appeal to the permit granting authority, as the zoning by ordinance or zoning bylaw may provide, may be taken by any person aggrieved by reason of his ability to obtain a permit or enforcement action by the administrative officer under the provisions of this chapter, or by the regional planning agency in whose area or city of the town is situated, or by any person, including an officer or board of a city or town or a budding city or town agreed by such order decision of the inspector of buildings or other administrative issue, official, excuse me, in violation of any provision of chapter ordinance uh, or the bylaw adopted here under. So um, the reference to agency or person was, was just simply to track uh, in a slightly more concise form the, uh, the language of who is entitled under Section 8 of the MGL to bring an appeal? Yeah, well, I, I mean, that's helpful to know because I didn't track that the way you did. Thank you. But I, I'd ask the staff, not tonight, but to take a look at whether you've somehow made this broader by just saying any other agency or person. But let's go um, beyond that. And then can you bring up what um, Ken was talking about on the screen? I don't know what you mean. I'm sorry. Do you mean? Ken, Ken mentioned something um, that I right there. You're, you're right there uh, under uh, staff, uh, staff provide the following additional consi considerations relevant to the article. Oh, oh, okay. Our, okay. our section, not the, not the edited. And then go up about maybe three or four sentences. That's what I was looking at. Okay. 
Got it. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, can you go back? Because I didn't read it that way. And, and clearly, if if that's the way it read, that presents the exact problem that Ken was mentioning, that if the building inspector has determined there's no case, you shouldn't be forced to go forward. I didn't read it that way, though. I think we'll just take, need to take a look at that and see if it's a real problem that needs to be dealt with in, in these revisions, because I may have missed that, but uh, I didn't see that um, coming up as an issue. It'll be me, Jean. Don't worry about it. No, no, that's okay. No, we should take a look at it, Kim, that's for sure. And I guess maybe after my other colleagues are done, we'll ask the building inspector. My last question for um, is, I mean, have things come up where you think this is necessary? Is there a history of concern that the building inspector hasn't acted in you know, a prompt enough manner that this is necessary? Uh, yes, the the motivation for the Warren article mm -hmm. article is grounded in exp um, specific experiences where complaints have been brought, violations have been found to exist by the building inspector's office, but then no fine or other enforcement action uh, took place. Um, did did the people come? Did the people growth. come in to compliance? Let's say if they gave them yeah. thirty or sixty days to move a fence or whatever, did they do that? No, no, the, the non-compliance persisted. Persists. So why? So I, how does, how does what you put in here change that? Because wouldn't 3.1.3 still give you the opportunity to go to the Board of Appeals in the situation you just mentioned? I think in the situation I just mentioned, yes, I think after I, I would, I believe it's untested, but I believe that after say a two year period of inaction that the Board of Zoning Appeals would likely um, agree that there is effectively um, a rejection of a complaint or a non-enforcement of a complaint. And I think at that point would accept jurisdiction. The, but it's not clear to me sort of at what period of time they would exercise that discretion. Um, I, I would imagine that if somebody tried to appeal after say two or three months of non-enforcement um, or pending enforcement, however you'd like to call it, that, uh, that the, zoning, the, uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals would likely reject that as saying there's not been enough time. Um, and I think that'd be appropriate for them to reject in that circumstance. It's not clear, however, at what point it becomes appropriate for the Board of Zoning Appeals to take on the matter. And the whole thrust of this proposal, I'm you know happy to fuss with the language, but the whole thrust of the proposal is simply to give a clear indication of when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate, frankly, for someone to be burdening the Board of Zoning Appeals with, with an appeal or with an attempted appeal prior to the building inspector having a period of time adequate to, um, to address the matter in his, own, his or her own discretion. So I, I, think, I think there's you know, benefits to both the Board of Zoning Appeal and potentially the building inspector's office and to all residents in town to have clarity about what is the timeline for which the building inspector should have discretion to uh, pursue enforcement as he or she thinks fit. And, and when, um, if no enforcement has actually been forthcoming, should a party be able to go to a board, go to the, uh, the zoning appeals, the board of zoning appeals, and, and when, you know, frankly, the board itself should know when it's, you know, and, you know, it's, it's, it's appropriate for it to begin uh, reviewing such matters. Do you think we do you think we could not make these changes and instead the uh, Board of Zoning Appeals, uh, through its rules and regulations, set out some standards under which 
it would determine, I'm not saying they would do this, I'm interested in hearing from them about this, but you know, standards that they would use to determine at what point it would be appropriate for them um, to hear an appeal. So again, the idea is that if, if something's gonna take six months to ameliorate, they're clearly not gonna do anything for six months, but if the six months have gone by and nothing happens, then maybe they, you know, then maybe they would entertain an appeal. So I'd be interested in hearing from the ZBA if there's a way that they can accomplish this through their rules and regulations that would be better than, than this because we're still left with some uncertainty about when they get to, to the board. So, so Jean, I'm going to actually, um, Jenny has her hand up. I'm going to throw it over to, to her to weigh in. And then also remind us, I, I believe that there is a, a warrant article for the ZBA to be able to set their own rules and, and regulations, which um, is which would address then, Jean, what, what you're um, referring to as well. So, Jenny, I'll, I'll move to you next. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'm, I appreciate the questions and the discussion that just occurred. Um, it made me re realize that one thing we did not include this in this memo um, to all of you is that this section of the bylaw was amended during zoning recodification to be shortened because it is one of many sections of the zoning bylaw that previously had been very expansive and had literally stated 40A section eight in great detail. And so we had shortened it where it just says as in general law 40A section eight as amended and felt that that captured you know, enough to basically point to state law without having to repeat state law, which is the way that the prior bylaw had been worded in many cases throughout the bylaw. So I just wanted to make that one clarification. It actually had been previously more expansive. That said, I actually, I'm not sure I like this shortened version that's being offered because I think it actually, it might be a little bit confusing and you'd end up going to Mass General Law 40A Section 8 to understand what exactly any other agency or person means. Um, so I, I just wanted to provide that one piece of clarity um, around why, why it looks this way and what had happened uh, in prior discussions about including citations of state law in the bylaw. Great, thank you, Jenny. Thanks. I don't, Jean, I don't any have last any, questions? Sorry. I don't have any other questions for now. Thank you so much, and thanks for the clarification, Jenny. Great, thank you. Um, Jean, before we move on to Melissa, you had mentioned wanting to hear from the building inspector. Did you have a specific question, such as um, you know, the challenges of currently complying with that? I, I think I'd like to pose if we ask him to weigh in a specific question for him. Um, yes, I, I think it would be what are the challenges he currently has um, and how does he or the department prioritize how they handle things that come to them, complaints? Great, thank you. I will, um, I will direct all of those questions to Inspector Champa at the, uh, at the end of the um, questions from the board. Uh, so Melissa, any, any questions for the uh, petitioner? Um, I was curious, Mark, in terms of a concrete example, I, it would be helpful if you could maybe run through an example. It sounds like you have personal history with it. I don't know if you want to explain that, but um, I'm trying to understand it from like just a practical application. Right. I, so there is um, specific examples that probably be um, uh, maybe not entirely appropriate to get into the details on this form, but I, I'd be happy to speak um, you know, to you privately if you wish to, to reach out and discuss that. I, I, but I, the, the, I can, I think, offer one point, which is that, um, the timing pressure on the other side. I mean, I think we all recognize that the building inspector um, does a, a great job for the town and has many demands on his time. And I know that um, multiple town meetings have considered, or you know, I think there's been multiple proposals in the past, including at the 2021 town meeting about whether there should be additional staff made available to the um, to the building inspector's office in order to assist with enforcement, since there, there's a bit of a, a lag or a drag in, in that regard. But the, the one thing that uh, I would just like to remind folks on is that, you know, there are statutes of limitation for how long a non-compliance can exist 
before it becomes grandfathered, right? And so um, this is the timing pressure for both the town and the complainants, and I guess the building inspector. The uh, relevant statutes, regard, um, the, the relevant section of Massachusetts general law that deals with a um, deals with the statute of limitations specifies exactly what stage of enforcement proceedings need to be achieved in order to toll the statute, in order to preserve the ability of the town to eventually take enforcement action against a non-compliant situation. So the um, the language about um, institute, you know, so the specific language that had been offered in um, 3.1.3 about um, proceed, instituting proceedings, you can see here about proceedings have not been instituted from the time set forth. That, that the point of, of referencing the institution of proceedings is specifically to get to the enforcement to a stage where the statute of limitations is being told and that the, the town has done enough to actually preserve its ability to continue to enforce against a, a non-compliant situation. So, um, so that, you know, I think that it, and that is in the, the instance that I referenced earlier where there was a complaint that was brought and no, no effective enforcement, no fine, no uh, civil action of any sort, certainly no criminal action had been brought within over two years after a determination by the building inspector that the violation existed. Um, you know, that, that eats into a significant chunk of the relevant statute of limitations. Thank you. Melissa, did you have any further questions? Um, yeah, I think we're going to ask um, our building inspector just a few questions, and I just want to know from his perspective how this helps or how this works as a tool um, in terms of, you know, his getting his job done. Great. I will add that to the list. Thank you. Uh, Steve, any questions for the uh, petitioner? I have nothing beyond what's already been asked. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Let's see. So, um, Inspector Champa, I think you're here with us this evening. Um, there were two questions that were asked that if um, you would be able to answer, I, I, the board would be appreciative. Um, the first would be the, the benefits of, or challenges of complying with a time period as proposed in this resolution. Um, and the second being, how um, do you and your department prioritize responding to uh, complaints? Those were the the two questions that I heard that would be helpful if you were able to um, shed some light on those. So, um, <clears throat> pri pri obviously, we prioritize anything uh, that involves safety or that um, can become more of a violation, um, such as working without a you know uh, working without a permit or um, open excavations. Um, we table anything that is is not becoming, uh, you know, not becoming dangerous and not actually changing in any way, um, until you know anything of more priority is is already dealt with. I think that um, the biggest issue is is that it, you know uh, with the, it, this particular um, situation is that it started at you know. Two years ago, roughly the beginning of the pandemic, I was under the direction of uh, Director Byrne at that time, um, and it, 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 at the time that um, that he retired, uh, this was before legal, for their opinion, um, which I did not send it to legal, um, but um, and. It involves an existing nonconformity that, um, as everyone would know on the board, that you know it sometimes takes a, a significant amount of time to determine how long that has been in existence. Um, such to the case where I recently reversed part of the determination, uh, it, you know, it, on this um, original you know, which was what was originally considered a violation. I've reversed my determination on it and found that it had been in existence long before uh, the 10 year period that the state allows. I'm Thank sorry, you. there was one, was there another question that, that I didn't answer? 
uh, I think you started to get to it, which was, you know, the benefits or challenges of um, having to comply with a new time period as proposed, which I think you started to get to with the fact that you've been, it's been an iterative process and, and it's taken some time to get to the, the determination of the, the timing for the existing nonconformity. But perhaps if you could expand on that, this proposal is um, centered really around putting in a specific time period. And I know that Mr. Benson's questions were around um, the, the benefits or challenges that you and your department might face with having a specific time period for a range of potential zoning issues. So, uh, I mean, obviously we have, we have statutory requirements that, um, you know, that, that take a precedent to, to anything and it, 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 putting a time period on something would only be effective during a time that we were able to accommodate, you know, all situations um, within the, the, the time allowed. Um, but you, you can't account for a situation in which, um, you know, your, your staff is depleted by, by 40% um, for a nine month period. Understood, thank you. Uh, Kim, I see that you have your hands up for uh, another question. Yeah, I just want to confirm that uh, 10 years is the, is the mark for uh, pre-existing condition, right? Once it's been in, can, once it's been something there for 10 years, then it's a pre-existing condition. Um, uh, I'll turn it, it looks like uh, Inspector Champa has his, his hand up to answer that. So it's 10 years if it was installed without a permit, if it was done uh, with a permit, it, it's six years. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, I'll, uh, Jean, I'll, uh, sorry, I'm trying to pull your face up here on the screen. Did, uh, did all of the questions that you had for the uh, building inspector, were, were those answered? Did you have other questions that I did not pose to him? Yeah, those, those are great. I actually have one more question for the petitioner. Yes. As a result of something um, that he said. And um, I'm, I'm getting the impression from his presentation that he's a lawyer. So um, I'm just wondering, do you think this could be rewritten so that the, the, um, the trip is not, you know, or the date is some, some not some number of days after the request, but just so that uh, the statute of limitations doesn't toll? It's a good question and a good, a good thought. You know, I think um, the item to remember with respect to the statute of limitations is that it doesn't get told just because it gets appealed to the zoning board, right? There has to be more than that. So you have to leave in pro time for both the zoning board to take the matter into advise it, under advisement, but to, you know, to get on the calendar, to brief them, to get their response, um, and, and for... Um, if you know, and then there's there's a further appeal, appellate process to define in the statute um, to the land court. So, you know, you'd have to get to the land court in order for things to actually toll. So you have to leave in ample time for that whole process to play out. Why wouldn't the statute begin running after the ZBA issues its decision? Because unfortunately, that's not how the Massachusetts legislature wrote the statute. The, the construct for tolling isn't a isn't an a feature of the Arlington zoning bylaws. It's a feature of the Massachusetts general laws. So I, I would, I would suggest thinking about if there's a way to rewrite this, so that the, the um, pertinent issue is preventing the tolling of the statute of limitations, um, and if you wanted to do that, you could bring it back to us. I'm certainly happy to entertain uh, suggestions of exactly that sort. So I, I thank you for making it. I'm, uh, I'm certainly not wedded to the reference to other agency or person in 3.1.3. I do, uh, at this point, I, I do feel like the reference of number of days from the request in 3.1.2b is, um, is appropriate. 3.2.1a 
already requires the building inspector to have done the entire investigation and to have made a determination about violation within 14 days of the request. So once the 14 day mark has been reached, either the building inspector should have found there is no evidence of a non-compliance and therefore issued his opinion, in which case a complainant, if he disagreed or she disagreed, would have an immediate right to appeal. No issue there. That that part of the zoning bylaw works as written. Um, or the building inspector has made a determination, either not made a determination or made a determination that a violation does exist. And the only question at that point is um, issuing the fines or instructing town council to begin other enforcement action. I actually think the more burden, I could be wrong, and I defer to Mr. Uh, to the inspector to, to, to weigh in. He obviously knows much better his job than I, I possibly could. But I would have thought the more burdensome part of this entire process is him having to investigate, make a determination within 14 days. And then once it comes to enforcement, I would have thought that would be relatively, I would have hoped, I hope on behalf of town, or as a member or resident of town, I would hope that that's less burdensome on him and that the burden of that shifts more towards town council or some other officials in, in the town. I mean, it, it's, but really it sounds like you're getting at those not, oh, we want this person to be fined. What you're getting at is we want the zoning violation to end. And that could theoretically take um, some amount of time because after notice and the demand, the violation has not been abated by the time set by the building inspector. So that says the building inspector finds a violation. The building inspector then gives a set period of time um, by which it has to be abated. And so what you're concerned about is either they're not acting within the 14 days or that the um, time to abate is so long that it tolls the statute of limitations. Am I getting that right? Essentially right. And yes, and maybe to clarify, I didn't mean to limit the building inspector's discretion to set an appropriate amount of time for rectification. So if it really was you know, a situation as you described where it takes nine months to, uh, to abate a nonconformity and his order is specific as to the deadline for the for the nonconformity to be addressed by the owner. And I, I don't, I wouldn't expect that necessarily to trump the language that was offered. Um, I, I think in some cases, or at least the ones I'm familiar with, there's not necessarily a, a deadline for abatements. It's, it's just an order to abate and then it sort of drags on without. Uh, you know, I mean, this, this, can, this can go on too long. So I'm yeah, just this is, say, this, I, I'd uh, like to can do something with the statute. I would be interested in that. Otherwise, I've expressed my concerns about this. Great, thank you, Gene. I appreciate it. Um, so at this time, what I'd like to do is open this up for any uh, public comment, um, any questions or comment that the public might have. Um, if you would like to speak, please use the raise hand feature under the participants um, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I, as I call on you, please introduce yourself by your first, last name, and address and you will be given up to three minutes to speak. I will start with John Warden. We can hear you, Mr. Warden. <clears throat> Thank you, John Warden, Jason Street, town meeting member. And, and one of the signatories on <coughs> uh, Mrs. Miliavsi's article. Um, <coughs> the only point I, I wish to make, and this was discussed uh, by the building inspector at the zoning bylaw working group, uh, meeting last um, it was a couple of weeks ago now, uh, first Wednesday of uh, March. Um, the, but the point I should like to make is that some not too many years ago, uh, an, an addition, an additional person was added to the inspection department, and the specific uh, provision of that person was justified uh, by the fact that he was. He or she, I don't know what the gender was, uh, was going to deal with enforcement because enforcement at that point uh, was found to be lacking, let me say. So this person was going to specialize with enforcement. So this person came on staff, but I don't know what happened then because apparently uh, there is still a problem. 
So I, I think um, I just wanted to say that that's, that's part of the history behind this, um, that um, the, the, there was an attempt, uh, at least town meeting voted the attempt to, to add this person and the salary, et cetera, uh, to the staff to do enforcement. And then the, and then the building inspector said, well, if the uh, Ms. Rate or, or Ms. Lineman uh, can uh, verify this, that, that there were, or this was inspector himself, that the, the COVID and the staff shore, I don't know what the staff shortages are and the, the incredibly expensive rebuilding the public works department and all this stuff was getting in the way of their doing their job. But uh, I, 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 I really think that the, you know, the, job ought, the job ought to be done. There shouldn't be zoning violations, even, even those who found by the inspector. And then, but then the, the, nothing is done to get them corrected. And I, I, I think that, I think that's what this, this, uh, this article is getting at. And I think it's something we should think well on. Thank you. Great. Uh, so the next speaker will be uh, John, War uh, excuse me, uh, Chris. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adam Street. Can you hear me okay? I can, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to offer just a um, perspective on this, one, as a former member of the ARB, and two, as someone who I dare say um, has made uh, more requests for enforcement to the uh, inspectional services um, than anyone else in town or, or close to it. Um, as we look at the current bylaw as it relates to enforcement, I guess I, I see several issues and I appreciate the proponent for bringing this article forward. Um, first under 3.1.2a, um, and this is a somewhat minor complaint is that it says if the building inspector finds a violation, he'll notify the person responsible, but it doesn't say anything about notifying the complainant. And it seems to me the complainant should be notified as well. And that same section says that the building inspector has the discretion to set the period uh, during which the violation has to be corrected if indeed there is one. And that's fine. But when you get to section B, um, it says if the violation is not corrected, the building inspector shall institute appropriate action. But it doesn't say when he has to do that. And it seems to me that is where a deadline should be established, that if indeed there is a violation with a, within a certain period of time, the, um, that, that um, enforcement action or appropriate action will be taken. As of right now, it's entirely discretionary. And in my experience, and I want to emphasize that my experience was with the past building inspector and not with the current one, um, things just didn't get enforced and didn't get done, even if there was a violation. And I, I would suggest that the, a change that should be made is that there be some deadline for taking that appropriate action if the, um, you know, if the violation is not corrected within the time determined by the building inspector. And finally, I would just like to add that under section 3.1.3, there is an appeal process to the Zoning Board of Appeals, but people you know, should understand that if you wanna bring that appeal, you're out 400 bucks. And I think that's a fairly high burden or large burden to place on someone who just wants to get the bylaw enforced. And I would hope uh, indeed if the ZBA has the discretion to amend those fees that consideration be given to lessening that amount, particularly if a violation has been found but not corrected. So I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Joe uh, Babiars. Hello and thank you. I I just wanted to suggest that. Excuse the, me. I'm sorry. Could you please introduce yourself first, last name, oh, and certainly. address? That's okay. Certainly. Thank you. My name is Josephine Babiars. I live at 59 Edge Hill Road in Arlington. And my concern is that we are requesting the building inspector to perform a number of things at a specific deadline where he may not have the sufficient staff or resources to be able to implement these requirements. And I worry that having specific deadlines of certain number of days or times may impact 
both the development that's going on in the in the Commonwealth, but also his ability to address new issues in terms of code implement implementations, new environmental regulations that may occur. And I don't, I, I saw that he reported a 40% decrease in his staff. And I suggest that that is inappropriate for the board to require specific timeframes for, for this kind of enforcement without sufficient staff. That's all I have to say and thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I just participated in the board at zoning board in well, favor of chief. I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, right, Steve, I'll reset your clock if you wanted to go ahead. Thank please. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say um, we have a new building inspector. The last building inspector was there for quite a while and had his way of doing things and ran the uh, department his way. Um, he, he is now retired after a long and very hard service and we appreciate that. However, I think we need to give the new building inspector a chance to uh, sort of establish and run the department his way. Um, and I think a lot of the uh, desire coming out of this particular uh, article is based on the many stories and scenarios that occurred under the old building inspector that now perhaps are going to be approached somewhat differently. I think we need to give them a chance to do that. I think we need to give them at least a year and moving beyond COVID because staff reductions changed all of our experiences, unfortunately, and in some cases, fortunately. But um, I think we need to give the building inspector a chance to, uh, uh, to establish the new approach uh, himself. And if it turns out after a year that folks are still finding that violations are not being remediated fast enough for whatever reason, we need to consider adding even more staff, like uh, Mr. Warden mentioned had happened uh, recent, in a couple of years past, because I think the town is looking for some significant enforcement of its zoning rules that it already has. I think the new building inspector has, uh, has heard that and will act accordingly, and we need to give him the chance uh, to, with, with appropriate staff to do that. Um, and if it's not enough staff, then we need to come back and check out the budget in a later town meeting to perhaps increase the staff further. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, so at this point, uh, without seeing any other hands raised, I will go ahead and uh, move on from public comment on Article 45. Um, I'll turn it back over to the board to see if there are um, any additional questions? Again, remembering that we will reserve debate for April 5th, or excuse me, April 4th. Um, any final questions uh, from Jean? Um, none at this time, thank you. Ken? No, I'm fine right now, thank you. Thank you. Melissa? No, I'd like to follow up with the applicant on understanding like his own personal story. And then I'd like to follow up with Chiampa just because I feel I'm concerned about kind of staff levels with regard to this. I, I do feel there's constraints um, on the other side um, fiscally for our town. And when we impose these additional regulations, I need to understand that better. Great, thank you, Melissa. Uh, Steve, any final questions for the applicant? Uh, no final questions. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you very much, Mr. Meazzo, for uh, your presentation this evening. Thank you for right. listening to attention. I, I, I'm happy to speak with, um, with Melissa at her convenience. And um, if I may I just clarify an earlier part of my statement, uh, I wanted to echo um, Mr. Moore. Uh, in stating, or rather, you know, he alluded to it, but it, it, I, I'm happy to confirm that, you know, the experience I was alluding to was under the previous building inspector, and I wasn't meaning to offer any commentary or, uh, or or judgment as to, to 
you know, to the good work that, that the current building inspector is, is doing. So thank you. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. Thank you for your thank you for your time this evening. I appreciate it as well. All right. Uh, so we'll now move on to Article 39, which is a zoning bylaw amendment related to mixed use in business districts, specifically the maximum floor area ratio allowed for mixed use structures in the business district. Um, this was inserted at the request of uh, David Pretzer and 10 registered voters. Uh, we'll go ahead and start by uh, asking Jennifer Rake if she has any uh, highlights or any comments that she would like to add to the memo that was prepared by the Department of Planning and Community Development. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'll be very brief because I think that we will have a long, uh, we will have a presentation by Zavid and we also have a number of people here that I'm thinking tonight would like to speak on this uh, particular article. Um, so in brief, I think um, you're, you, we will hear from the petitioner about their uh, perspective about why this is necessary. The background that I provided in the memo just simply highlights the department's past with the board, <laughs> our efforts uh, to look at FAR and potentially that as alongside other matters to encourage better development, uh, particularly along our major corridors like Broadway and Mass Ave. However, when we had looked at this previously, we had actually proposed changes that were increases ranging from 1.5 to roughly you know, three FAR, not, not, um, not quite the same. And across multiple business districts, different types of changes that were initially proposed. Um, while this is in keeping with some elements of the master plan, as well as the board's goals, I do think that it, is, uh, it merits a discussion about what we, what we are looking for uh, and also whether or not changing FAR really has a major, a significant impact on development uh, in light of the fact that, as I said, there are many other matters within the zoning bylaw that cut into uh, new potential development that are not being addressed by this bylaw nor any other zoning amendment being proposed uh, on this warrant. So um, I think with that, I'm gonna pause and I'll be happy to answer questions or provide additional commentary and turn it over to Mr. Uh, or Dave, David Pretzer rather. Great, thank you, Jenny. Uh, David, we would love to hear from you if you could uh, introduce yourself by your first last name and address. And then um, we, uh, happy to, to welcome you with six minutes for your presentation. Um, certainly. Um, uh, let me just, oh, you, you've got slides up. Should I, should I present my screen or are you presenting it? Uh, if you could just let Jenny know when to advance the screen, she'll present them um, for you from the presentation you submitted. Thank you. Okay. Um, yes. So, hi, I'm David Pretzer from 44 Grove Street. Um, and I'm um, here to talk about my proposal to increase the FAR limit for mixed use buildings in Arlington. Uh, next slide. So there are some really nice buildings that exist in Arlington today that many people in our town love that would not be legal to build under current zoning. Um, why is this? Well, one major reason is floor area ratio. Next slide. Um, in 2016, a town meeting voted to allow mixed use buildings as, fall as, as tall as five stories uh, with some restrictions in business districts. But there hasn't been um, construction of buildings of that scale since then. Why? One major reason is floor area ratio. Next slide. So uh, what is FAR or floor area ratio? Um, I'm, the board is already aware, but for anyone else, um, I'd just like to briefly say it is the ratio of the floor area of the floor space within the building to the size of the lot. So for example, a building with a floor area ratio of two could be a two-story building that covers the entire lot, or it could be a four-story building that covers half the lot, or any number of variations, as long as the floor area of the space within the building is twice the, you know, sort of the ground area of the lot. Uh, next slide. Um, and as the board is aware, our business districts are a couple of different classifications of land that are on or near our major transit corridors of Mass Ave and Broadway. Um, they allow commercial mixed use buildings mainly, um, and they're currently a mix of single and multi-story buildings. Next slide. 
And the status quo today in terms of the zoning bylaw is the max floor area ratio for mixed use and business districts ranges from 1.0 to 1.8. And so while the zoning in these districts theoretically allows three to five story buildings, um, in many cases, the FAR limits make this impractical to actually build. Next slide. So uh, my proposal in Article 39 is to increase the floor area ratio to 4.0 for mixed use buildings in the B2 through B5 districts. Next slide. So why, why is it a good idea to increase FAR limits? Um, I think there are a number of good reasons. Uh, the Arlington's Housing Production Plan and Master Plan um, view uh, increased mixed use development as a goal for, um, for several reasons, and this would uh, help with that. It would provide new subsidized affordable housing units via our existing inclusionary zoning percentage, which only provides benefit to the town if we actually have new construction that then creates the units. Um, it would support public transit by allowing more people to live near our existing public transit um, and reduce our dependence on, uh, on private cars. Um, uh, from my point of view, the FAR doesn't really determine what the buildings look like. We have other mechanisms in our zoning that are easier to understand and more effective. Um, and I don't think FAR really um, is the best way of achieving our zoning goals. Uh, allowing this development would increase Arlington's tax base via new growth, growth which um, provides benefits to our town. Uh, without the ability to build these mixed use structures, it's likely that the only development we're going to um, see would be 40B developments, which are likely to be only housing, um, which, uh, doesn't, which doesn't get us the benefits of a mixed commercial and residential space. And allowing this construction would increase the vibrancy uh, along our major transit corridors of Mass Ave and Broadway. Next slide. Um, so just to give people a clearer idea of what um, floor error ratio is like and what this might accomplish. I want to share some buildings currently in town that wouldn't be allowed today under our current zoning. And also for comparison purposes, a uh, building that was proposed recently and some buildings in nearby uh, municipalities as well. Um, next slide. So um, everyone always loves to talk about the Capitol Block, and I also love to talk about the Capitol Block. Um, it's a very nice building in East Arlington that I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, it's a three-story building, um, and currently its FAR is 2.6, which is significantly above the maximum under current zoning of 1.4. So um, I, I think buildings like this are really add to our town, and it would be great if we could legalize uh, more buildings of this sort. Uh, next slide. Here's another building um, in Arlington that um, is also similarly exceeding the current, uh, currently legal FAR um, that I think we should be encouraging. Next slide. Um, this one, is, as the board uh, probably recognizes, was proposed about a year ago um, as a building in East Arlington near the Capitol Block. Um, this, is, this was proposed as a four-story building that included uh, a building above the parking, which is a, an efficient use of space. Um, because it was using the space above the parking for additional units, it has a, a particularly high FAR of 3.2, which is more than double what's currently allowed in its zoning. This would have produced also 20% affordable housing units above the uh, by law required minimum, um, and the ARB was uh, unable to even consider giving it a special permit because the FAR that was proposed was beyond the requirement and the ARB was unable to um, give an exemption, legally unable to give an exemption to that FAR limit. Uh, next slide. Um, and here's just another example of a building in Watertown that's a mixed use building that um, would be above what's allowed in Arlington today. Next slide. And here's an example of a building in Davis Square that you know um, would have an FAR above three like the one that was proposed in East Arlington. Next slide. 
So um, here, I really feel like we've got an opportunity to legalize buildings that we love, uh, enhance the vitality of our major corridors, um, increase tax revenue for our, ta for our town, and make the height limits at town meeting already approved possible to attain in practice by increasing the FIR limits for mixed use and business district. This is a small but important change. It promotes housing creation, it pr promotes public transit, and walkability of our commercial areas. We have the power to improve our town zoning and I think now is a perfect time to take this step forward. I would love to hear any and all questions. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, Jean, we will start with you for any questions. Uh, thank you and, and thank you for bringing this to us. I guess my only question is why four? as opposed to another number? Uh, sure, thank you. Um, I, I think that's an excellent question. Um, when I presented this late last year, as you remember, I was initially proposing this with uh, three, and some of the feedback I got from the ARB at the time was to consider whether a higher number would be more appropriate. And so I did some additional investigation and research, and um, I, I, for this proposal, I went with four as a round, you know, as a sort of a round number that would allow all my sort of target example buildings. Uh, it aligns with what Watertown allows in their central business district, which was a basis for comparison. Um, and, you know, basically one of the things I was looking at is we had to propose there um, my example of a four story building that had an FAR above three because it used units over parking. And I personally think that units over parking is a very efficient use of space that we should encourage. And if we want a five-story building to be possible um, <laughs> in such a configuration, it seems like we need you know, some, to have the FAR somewhere in the 3.5 to four range to enable that. I could certainly see adjusting these numbers. Part, part of what I was going for was just a fixed number to sort of simplify things rather than having a bunch of different requirements, but it could also make sense to have one FAR for like a where five story buildings are allowed and a lower number where in four stories and a lower number for three stories. So I think if the board wants to um, pursue that direction, I think that could also make a lot of sense. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. I, I, I guess I'll just comment that, yeah, I remember when you came a few months ago to discuss this as a possibility. I'm, I'm not sure every member of the board suggested going above three, but um, I'd be interested to hear what uh, the other members of the board have to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Ken, questions or thoughts? Yeah, thank you, David, for bringing this up. Um, you, when you, this is uh, for as of right, you're saying, right, David? So my, my understanding is that mixed use buildings and business districts already require a special permit and this wouldn't change that, but I'm not completely sure about that. Okay, let me rephrase my question. Um, to get this bonus of uh, FAR, FAR of four, I would like to uh, bring in the inclusionary clause in there and saying that if there was uh, affordable housing with this, then four is uh, is allowable. Um, it is as a carrot, you know. And um, if there was um, if there was no affordable housing, then we may go with a lower number or go with the number as is. Um, I think you are one hundred percent correct. Uh, having a low FIR does uh, prohibit. Uh, development um, along the corridor, and you, uh, I think uh, this is one of the tripping factors. I think there's others, but we're gonna. We, I think we're talking about this one right now. Uh, we can address others, but I think if adding some sort of clause in there uh, about affordable housing, I'm sure we, once we get to the size, we're gonna get there anyways, just because of the number of units and everything else. That it's it's already already in play, but it, we may want to go from. Uh, 15 to 20 percent or something along those lines where we have a carrot out there that um, that uh, also um, encouraged uh, a little more diverse housing 
Uh, and may I be... ask a, a question to make sure that we're giving um, kind of clear guidance and we can come back to this as, as well after everyone's spoken and we've heard from the public. Are you suggesting um, a percentage above the existing inclusionary, inclusionary zoning to get to trigger the, the four? Yes. Okay. Would you consider that, David? Um, I, I think I think it's definitely worth considering. Um, my my concern is that I, I don't I don't really have the data, and I'm concerned that if the inclusionary zoning percentage is increased too much, then that might um, make it too difficult for these buildings to actually be built. My understanding is that with the current 15 percent, we've seen relatively little development that's been using the the inclusionary zoning and not under 40B, and so. I think I'd definitely be open to increasing that, but I, but I would, you know, like to depend on the expertise of the board and the planning department in ensuring that um, the number chosen isn't going to be so high as to make it uh, too difficult to uh, actually create housing. Um, so I think that's my main uh, concern, but I could definitely see changing this to only apply to buildings that are going to hit the inclusion existing inclusionary zoning which I think in practice they would likely anyways, or something that would be more of a density bonus. I think those are all worth considering. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Melissa, any questions for, um, for David? Um, no, not at this point. Thank you, Melissa. Steve, any questions for David? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so I was a town meeting member in 2016 when this was passed. And you know, I remember some of the discussions about FAR and height at the time. Um, I would wonder, I'd like to know if uh, Zavid would possibly consider a friendly amendment, uh, which rather, rather than going with a fixed FAR of four to essentially double what's allowed in the mixed use or allowed in the, uh, for mixed use in the uh, designated business districts, um, basically, but capping it at three. So essentially that would uh, still give us a range of FAR values um, between two and three. And my rationale for proposing this is as follows. Um, as the director mentioned, there's a number of, you know, regulations that affect what can be built. And, you know, in addition to FAR, we have a FAR-like dimensional regulation in our zoning bylaws. It's called open space. Uh, basically, this is a por portion of a lot that's not occupied by a structure or parking or used for vehicular traffic, but the requirement is based on a percentage of the gross floor area. So the larger the building, the more open space it requires. Now, it's not obvious how these two interact. Um, so over the weekend, I sat down, drew a bunch of tables and just kind of worked out numbers. And with a three-story building, um, you can accommodate an FAR of two, but by the time you get to two and a half, you run up against the limitation of the open space. Uh, at five stories, this happens between an FAR of three and three and a half. So th between two and three, I think actually calibrates the regulations to, you know, the other dimensional requirements and still makes it possible to, um, you know, or it still gives some opportunity to reach the height limits of the districts. So I guess my first question is, um, David, would you be open to a, a change like that? Um, yeah, thank you for your question. I think I'm definitely open in general to playing around with the, these numbers. And I understand that um, it's the board's you know, discretion what the main motion will be if the board ends up recommending action on this article. I will say, that my my personal thought is that for a five-story building, I would prefer an FAR limit of at least 3.5 because I'm concerned that an FAR limit of three will uh, would be too restrictive for a five-story building to actually get built based on the examples that I've seen. And I think if um, I think if the the board or the planning department has better data that shows otherwise, I'm definitely open to hearing that. But based on what I've looked at. I think that's my main concern with the specific numbers that you stated, but I'm definitely open to um, modifying these numbers in general. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, nothing further, Madam Chair. Great, thank you, Steve. 
Uh, any other questions from members of the board before I open this up for public comment? We will have um, an opportunity to follow up with questions following public comment. Okay, I don't see any, sorry. I do have my hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. I couldn't see Eugene. <laughs> I just wondered if, if based upon what Steve has suggested, whether Steve or Zavid or, or maybe Jenny can explain why um, in each of the business districts, there's one FAR for buildings above a certain square foot and a lower FAR for building larger buildings. Seems a little anom anonymous to me. And I just wondered if there was any explanation. Jenny, would you like to field that one? I see Steve waving. <laughs> no, I, my recollection, and I invite correction if this, if I, my recollection is wrong, but the, uh, there are two FAR limits, one for parcels under 20,000 square feet and one for parcels above 20,000 square feet. And my understanding was that with the smaller parcels, it's, you're working with a tighter space and there's, you know, the space itself is more constraining. So the higher FAR was kind of, it was intended to be a little bit of a, a break um, to just deal with the, you know, the restrictions, the inherent restrictions of having a small, smaller uh, parcel to work with. And you have anything to add to that? Just to make it clear that it also relates to building height. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's both FAR and building height. I mean, in case that's not evident, um, the two together and depending upon the size of the parcel, that's why you have those two different rows which are which is throughout the bylaw when it talks about mixed use. Okay, thank you. And can you, Jenny, can you just remind us um, the FAR that was approved for the industrial districts um, at town meeting last year? Let me let me get back to you. Okay, that's fine. We can return to that one after. after. Any other questions for um, either Jenny or? Uh, the uh, petitioner. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to open um, Article 39 uh, up for public comment. Again, please use the raise hand function. As I call on you, please introduce yourself by your first, last name and address, and you will have up to three minutes to uh, address the board. And we will start with John Morton. Okay. Thank, th thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, uh, may I ask why my picture isn't uh, shown? Uh, that's a setting on your end. That's not something that we control. Oh, on my end. Well, I pushed the thing that, that said picture, but nothing happened. So, okay. Well, if you could just introduce yourself, please. First, last name and, and address. We'll have uh, to um, go ahead and, and move without it. I will speak, speak out of the darkness then, but it's... Thank you. It is me, John Warden, Jason Street. <clears throat> Um, I, I think this is a, my opinion, a bad idea. Uh, I think if we want to do something about mixed use, I think the first thing that has to be done doesn't require any amendment to the bylaws. What it requires is for the board to go back to the discussion of 2016, when this was adopted, why they persuaded town meeting to adopt this mixed use provision and they were and the talk was about vibrant shops on the first floor and maybe offices upstairs and some residences further up and uh this whole little community would be doing all this stuff together and what we've gotten is apartment buildings without the setbacks uh open space parking etc that apartment buildings uh require and it's it, uh, and i'm sorry to say I spoke at the town meeting. I urged you to support an amendment that would uh, put some requirements for specific percentages of resident of non-residential use, commercial, industrial, whatever, office uses that pay taxes to the town, but don't send any kids to school or any of that stuff. Um, and and that was not approved because we were assured that the re you can trust the redevelopment board, they'll do the right thing. But look at the re re look at the mixed use buildings you've approved. The one on Summer Street has one little office that's used by the management of the building 
Well, every good building has a management office anyway. Uh, the, 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 the one that's going up now across from the high school um, is we're going to have one little shop in the corner or something like that. Uh, and and the, the, the one across the street, uh, Carney's Folly, has uh, a bunch of blank windows at the ground floor. So these vibrant commercial retail uses, et cetera, have not existed. And it's because the board has not insisted on doing what the indication was that they would do when they got town meeting to approve this. And, and, they, they, and someone says, well, it's not economically viable. We can't, what they're saying is I can't make a huge enough profit. And I've never seen the board say, show us the, show us the figures, show us your construction costs, show us your margin of profit that you expect. No, they just say, oh dear, well, we can't. Okay, well, we'll let you have an, an apartment building, but please put a little shop in the corner. That is the improvement you need to make. And you can take that decision yourself by, by doing what you indicated to town meeting you would be doing when you got town meeting to approve this. Thank you. The next speaker this evening will be Steve Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, I, I only will have one uh, one com one. This will be my last comment tonight, unlike last week where I seemed to speak, uh, speak on everything. Um, and I, I again, I want to uh, thank the planning department for their uh, for their insightful memos. I find them very helpful to give uh, give good perspective on what this means, sort of in the context of uh, what the zoning currently is and what's being proposed. Um, I've got to say that I, I don't I don't support this sort of uh, piecemeal uh, approval to rezoning and zoning changes. I I feel that they often represent uh, a very a very narrow um, set of interests and 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 definitely do not necessarily represent wide consensus, um, particularly from from the folks who don't follow meetings like this this closely. Um, and I don't, I don't think that that's particularly healthy. I know that the eventual goal here is to, to go to town meeting. Um, I, don't, I don't find town meeting uh, a, a good venue to do this sort of thing ad hoc, as was evidenced in, uh, in 2019 when the ask was too big and everything went, uh, went down in flames that particular year. Um, I, I do think that, um, that the ARB and the ZBA uh, and the planning department should be basically annually putting forth a slate of changes that incrementally change zoning um, and bring that before uh, town meeting every year, rather than have uh, citizen motions like this that really aren't done in a coherent, consistent framework or fashion. They just look at a particular thing that again, might represent a kind of narrow interest. I, I don't think that's a good way to deal with these, as you know, clearly very contentious issues. Um, and as is evidenced by, I can see all the people that want to speak on this one, one thing. Um, so I, I, would, I would hope in the future that the various boards and, and uh, the planning department get together and present annual, again, internally consistent and coherent slates of changes and we discuss them at town meeting that way rather than piecemeal. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Barbara Thornton. Thank you, Barbara Thornton, uh, 223 Park Ave and uh, Precinct 16. I love this. I, I love it as a city planner. I love it as an Arlington resident, and I love it as somebody who likes to walk down neighborhoods and find them interesting and vibrant and fun. And if there's any concern that this won't work in Arlington or what it takes to have enough uh, residents upstairs in order to make those fun street level stores exist, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about that ratio between people who live upstairs and people that are on the street, uh, the, the, the stores on the street, I suggest you go to Portsmouth, New Hampshire and walk around. It's half the size of Arlington. It is a fun place to go. And they have four and five story apartment buildings that you don't even notice that they're there, except that as a city planner, I know that those apartment buildings are supporting the street life on the main streets 
the residential areas, Strawberry Bank, all there, you can preserve it. It's not affected. But the street life on your commercial corridors is fun. The only other comment that I, that I want to suggest in regard to uh, Steve Revelak's comment about open space, the parcels in Arlington on the main corridors are really small. And it's hard to say you're going to take the parcel and you're going to require more open space. And I wonder if there isn't a, a creative way we can think about looking at open space per block rather than open space per parcel. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Brian McBride. Hello. Uh, yeah, Brian McBride, 36 Eastern Avenue. Uh, thanks to the board for the service of the town. So, so I'm concerned, um, I'm a citizen with a lot of planning, training or, or background, but I'm just concerned about the scale and scope of some of the developments that I've seen proposed for the town. I'm not sure how this um, particular item fits in with that scale that I'm worried about, but I, you know, I see the Al Wife expansion, I hear about the Muger property, and I'm just worried that the scale of the town is going to be changed detrimentally you know, we're in this economic boom in Boston and Cambridge. I heard in the news today that Boston created more jobs than any city but four others in the whole country. But booms come and go, right? We've seen digital and Wang, we've seen the Rust Belt, uh, the urban flight and so forth. I just want to advise the board to be cautious and think about the legacy in the future and what we're leaving for our grandchildren and make sure that the scale of the city uh, the town is livable and appropriate for um, for what we're looking for. Just urging some restraint. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be James Fleming. Sorry, am I audio audible now? You are. Yes. You caught me doing dishes. Um, so I like this article a lot. Um, I'm I, sorry, James. Could you oh, just yeah, introduce yeah. yourself? Thank you. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, sorry, James Fleming, um, Oxford Street. Um, I really like the article. Um, aside from the Capitol building, there are a lot of older commercial buildings in East Arlington where even an FAR that, that's currently there is not enough for them to go to a second story, which I think is ridiculous. And the reason is that their lot coverage is extremely high. So like 90, 95% of the lot is covered. It's how they used to build buildings. So I think at minimum, you need an FAR of at like two to go even up to a second story. Um, I don't think four is the right number for now. I think it's a bit of a big change, but I think you should at least go to two and to Steve's point, maybe even up to three just to get a few more stories on there. The people who built those buildings would never have imagined they would stay one story forever. It, it just, it wouldn't have been thinkable. They would eventually add a second and a third story. They would have added other uses, apartments, you know, whatever have you at the time. And as the community developed, they would become more intensively used. The streets would get better improvements. It would be a nicer area. That's, that's how you build wealth. And wealth is what we tax in the town to support everything. So I don't think that we should get in the way of that to some degree, because if we do and keep the current regulations, then whatever is there right now is the peak and we'll, we wouldn't really ever get much more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Jennifer Seuss. Hi, uh, Jennifer Seuss, 45 Teal Street. Um, so I thank David for bringing this article uh, to the attention of the board and to the community. I um, I think this is a good idea. So people often uh, are nervous about zoning changes because of unanticipated consequences, but it's just as often true that a zoning change is ineffective because we don't, you know, because maybe the interrelation either wasn't understood or maybe for political reasons, you know, wasn't disentangled. Um, and I think that's very much the case here. In 2016, the town meeting voted over two thirds, we did not have housing choice at the moment, to allow three, uh, up to five stories on the corridors if they're mixed use with a setback at three feet, at three stories. And there was a lot of excitement about what that could bring. And in the intervening years, what I've heard from people is a lot of frustration that th they didn't see more building and, and, and sort of confusion about what, like, why don't we see more building? What, what's the barrier here? Um, and it took me a long time to understand what the barriers were. And I think this is clearly one of the barriers um, that the FAR is too, too low. Um, I appreciate the board's um, consideration and um, thoughtfulness about this, about getting the numbers right 
I don't have any particular view about whether four or three is the right number. Um, it clearly needs to be higher. And I'm, I'm glad that there's such um, great expertise on this and, and very careful, thoughtful consideration. Um, so I appreciate that we have a citizen bringing this. And I also appreciate the expertise of the board and the planning department in making sure that we get everything right. Um, I think this is something that uh, town meeting uh, should consider. I think it's, it's ref reflection of what they've wanted in the past. And, um, and I, I hope you get us, give us another chance to uh, sort of go back and, and sort of get it right and, and reflect sort of what we were looking for in, the, in 2016. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Stephanie M. Hansel. Hi, my name is Stephanie Hansel. I live at 3 Cleveland Street. I believe this proposed change is too extreme. This isn't an incremental approach. This is a huge exponential increase in the floor area ratio. And I don't believe it's applicable to the type of business districts we have here in Arlington. I did some research on maximum floor area ratios in comparably sized business districts in nearby towns, and no town has an FAR in all of its business zones. For example, Brookline has a maximum FAR of 0.5 to 1.75. Coolidge Corner, for example, is, is uh, 1.75 FAR. Newton has uh, you know, standards from 1.0 to 2.5, and 2.5 is only allowed by special permit. The town that was given as an example, Watertown, um, has a maximum FAR of 1.0 in its regional mixed use districts. I mean, I think the point is that not one size fits all different types of business districts. And I'm very concerned that this proposal is for a very large increase across almost all of our business districts, which are neighborhood business districts, which are village business districts. They don't seem to be able to accommodate the type of density that the petitioner seems to wish for. I'm really concerned by the loss of business space that this is going to cause because we've seen it already. The example that the petitioner gave about the proposed development at 190, 200 Mass Ave was going to be resulting in the loss of 7,500 to 8,000 square feet of business space in the heart of a business zone in East Arlington. And that's really unacceptable. And there's no guarantee that increasing the FAR by this much is not going to cause that. We're going to see that again and again. So in, in conclusion, I just feel that this is a really broad and sweeping change, and it really does not allow us to see the potential impacts of this. A more carefully specified and realistic proposal could allow for us to really evaluate that, be that better, to engage in wider community conversation and planning. And we could also make those changes that we really want because we would know what the goals are and I just really think that there has to be a balance and this proposed amendment isn't the isn't a balanced amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Fiddling around with key elements of our zoning bylaw is not something to be done lightly. As our planning department described it, floor area ratio is just one element an array of dimensional restrictions. It is unwise to simply say, well, why don't we double or triple or even quadruple in some instances the allowable FAR without evalu evaluating the wider consequences. The presentation given this evening is superficial and factually incorrect in its specific examples, which I have detailed to the board in a letter this past week. Five Water Street actually has an FAR of just 1.66, which is well within the zoning limit of 1.8. And the primary reason that the Capitol Theater could not be built in its present form is that it lacks the required 30 foot setback in the rear yard, providing both required parking and a buffer from the abutting homes. If you add in this strip, the FAR drops to only 1.36, again, within our current bylaw maximum. Not every lot is suitable for five-story buildings. Here is an example of a B3 district property that is a good fit for such development. It's at 180 Mass Ave, 14 commercial condominiums in a three-story building 
with both street level retail spaces and offices offering jobs within walking distance to Arlington homes. The lot contains parking for employees and customers and a buffer from the homes on Chandler and Egerton. The current FAR is about 1.0. Potentially, one could add two more floors of residential um, with upper story setbacks and roof decks. The primary use would still be commercial, but with an additional 9,000 square feet of accessory residential. The resulting FAR, it would be just 1.4. This is what is possible today with our current FAR limits. I'll stop here and use my remaining time to answer any questions from the board of planning regarding the details in my letter. Uh, thank you. I don't believe that we have any questions. Uh, the next speaker this evening will be Catherine Peterson. <clears throat> Hello, um, Catherine Peterson from uh, 31 Chandler Street. Can you hear me? I can, thank you. Um, so my concern about this uh, is first of all, I'm just wondering if um, you've considered polling citizens around, uh, citizens in Arlington just to see if people are um, fully aware of this uh, proposal and um, or what what a proposal like this might do to the character of the town. I think that we need more um, voices involved in this. Um, so that's one of the points I wanted to make. Another point is that we're just coming off of a pandemic and we haven't yet given uh, businesses uh, an opportunity to recover. And so we don't know yet what um, the use might be of um, the spaces that we have, like if we can even accommodate um, businesses and all these new spaces that would be proposed. Um, that's another concern is just a dramatic uh, move at a time when we're still in recovery mode. Um, another uh, concern is um, I'm just wondering about the accessory dwelling units. So part of the argument for this, um, from what I understand is providing more affordable housing. Um, but we just recently uh, provided uh, ADUs. So we're supporting the use of ADUs, but we haven't yet uh, studied how that's gonna happen. We, we don't know yet um, what's gonna come about from that. And I'm just wondering, why also making another um, dramatic change um, in the character of the town without first seeing how that change is gonna actually unfold. Um, I also have concerns about whether the town schools can support a dramatic FAR increase. So th those are my main concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Elaine. Hi there, uh, this is Elaine Maynard uh, and I reside at 13 Chandler Street um, in East Arlington. I think I just wanna take um, a brief opportunity to uh, sort of support and um, mirror um, the, some of the comments of, of other speakers. Um, I think that a far increase to uh, 4.0 is dramatic and unprecedented in towns similar to Arlington. Um, and I also think that projects need to be evaluated on their own merits um, and uh, really assessed with, with the risk factors and, and potential benefits. And so, um, you know, I certainly recently lived through the 180 to 200 Mass Ave proposal. Um, and that proposal in and of itself um, was lacking in a lot of evaluation of some very, you know, kind of basic concerns. Um, and so I see each project, I see this as a project by project consideration. Um, those considerations range from everything to appropriate and timely traffic studies to um, an assessment of, you know, how uh, neighborhoods will be impacted, how, can, uh, how the overall community will be impacted. Um, and so, I certainly support and get the need to um, 
uh, for more mixed use in Arlington. Uh, but um, this feels to me, as I think um, a previous uh, caller said, you know, very broad um, and kind of without bounds. And, um, you know, I think that there's a thoughtful evaluation that needs to take place on a project by project basis. Um, and my concern is that, uh, you know, this sort of sets us off in, in increasing something dramatically for the purpose of increasing something dramatically without really thinking about, you know, kind of all the, the, the bits and pieces um, uh, that go into the thoughtful assessment of a project. So appreciate the time um, and appreciate the opportunity to, 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 to voice my concerns. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be KD. Might that be Kelly Doherty? Okay. <laughs> Just have to go by uh, what I see on the screen. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I apologized for that. No worries. Uh, confusion. Kelly Doherty, I'm at uh, 12 Chandler Street. And and I want to re reiterate what everyone says. Uh, I mean, the, the supporters as well as the folks who are concerned, and I happen to be among the concerned, um, I think we all value the, the vibrancy of a mixed use town. Arlington is a mixed use town already. It's got, you know, the beautiful Capitol Theater in my neighborhood is one of the reasons I moved here and one of the reasons I've stayed and live here and, and love it. Um, I think we all want to encourage development projects like the Capitol Theater. Um, the problem is, is I don't think we've really studied this particular proposal adequately. So I wanna agree with the folks who've expressed a concern that a, a wider review and perhaps a bit more study is merited. For instance, um, some of the development projects that were listed uh, and that have occurred in Arlington already have actually removed commercial space and they are much more heavily residential. Um, I can speak vocally to the one at, at uh, 19200 or 18200 that was proposed. Um, there were many neighbors very vocally opposed to that project and I don't want this to turn into uh, my personal views on that project, but it, it gives a really good example for why we were opposed. And one of the issues was the parking garage beneath all of the residential development. They were going to shrink the commercial space and then they were gonna put a parking garage there, which works beautifully in Portsmouth. I agree with the, the planner who'd mentioned that, but I think a lot of us may have concerns about Mass Ave becoming a parking garage corridor. And we do have to think about the repercussions of that on the vibrancy of a walkable community and on the vibrancy of the commercial development that we wanna see encouraged in town. I'm not opposed to increasing the FAR for specific projects. So I wanna reiterate the folks who have said, let's offer a carrot, but I don't think it should just be affordable housing. I think that should be on the list, but I think brick facades, a beautiful, you know, make the developers really work for this type of, of grace that, that the town of Arlington is gonna grant them and make sure that in doing so, they are meeting all of the objectives of the town, including traffic. Traffic is a, a big issue, especially when you look at access and egress from parking garages, because in many cases, that is gonna be on the residential side street and not on the Mass Ave corridor. So these are all key considerations. So I think we just need to study this a bit more and have some more wider community input. But I think that, that I don't wanna say we're opposed to mixed use. This is, you know, we love mixed use. We just wanna see it done properly. And a really wide swath of something of this size, it could really damage our town for years to come. So I, I do want to express my concern about it in that way. So thank you for listening. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Matthew Owen. Hi, I'm Matthew Owen. I'm at 164 Forest Street. Um, I'd like to voice strong approval for this warrant article, although, um, as with members of the board, you know, I don't know that the exact numbers like in the current draft of the warrant article are, you know, exactly what needs to be the final numbers. And that that's something that um, may need to be worked out before this finally gets to town meeting. Um, but yeah, this is a proposal that I even sort of independently thought was a good idea based on attending 
redevelopment board meetings. Um, one example was the the board, you know, last fall approved a mixed use um, proposal at uh, Mass Ave and Medford Street, and um, that's over sort of the the old Papaginas, and that that proposal maxed out its FAR at 1.5 um, and only managed to add sort of one story of residential above the commercial space. So essentially for that space, at least if they were, you know, including any parking there, they were, they were pretty much limited to only a single story of, of residential as part of that mixed use project. Um, and I think that's, yeah, just not, enough for a sort of the vibrant mixed use um, commercial district, especially like right in Arlington Center there. Um, it's kind of ridiculous that it sort of caps the building height for that use at effectively two stories, considering that down Medford Street, half a block, there's a, a residential building dating from 1890 that's three stories tall. Um, so it, yeah, it doesn't really stand to reason that there stronger limitations to the building height now effectively than there than there were 130 years ago. Um, so yeah, I'd just like to um, suggest that the board, you know, maybe fidgets with the numbers, but um, recommends this for approval by town meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Sarah Tuttle. Thank you so much um, for, for letting me speak and for this. Um, my name is Sarah Tuttle. I am at 44 Grove Street. I am definitely married to David, <laughs> um, but we are different people and we have different views. So I wanted to speak my perspective on this um, on this this evening. Um, I, I really love this proposal and I love it because it's so specific, because it makes possible development that otherwise meets goals and requirements that our community has. Um, as somebody who has, my family has a long history in Arlington. I love this community. Um, and I, I see what we, what we could be and I see what we are and I love what we are, but I know we could do better. And I feel like our low FIR limits right now really prevent us from meeting community goals like an adequate affordable housing stock, like buildings that, that provide this vibrant community and this vibrant walkable community. So I just really wanna underscore that for me, a big selling point of this particular um, proposal is that it makes possible development that otherwise meets the requirements of the town, that what this does to me is remove a, build, is remove a, a block um, from our potential. And I just wanted to, to state that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, the next speaker will be Aram Holman. Hello, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay. Uh, Aram Holman, 12 Whittemore Street, candidate for town meeting in precinct six. I oppose article 39. I see it as one more attempt to raise zoning limits and density. I think it's motivated by a desire to increase the town's tax base by converting business space to more valuable housing. This density might be justified if it created affordable housing. This article dispenses entirely with the false claim that greater density will create affordable housing. Indeed, it doesn't even mention affordable housing at all. Mixed use was an earlier attempt to facilitate the conversion of business to housing. This is another. Arlington's development priorities should be to create more business space and to create more truly affordable housing, not the fake affordability that's called 40B. This article will facilitate the creation of not merely market rate housing, but luxury housing. It will do so at the expense of what we need more business and more affordable housing. Like mixed use, it'll further the, cannibal, the cannibalization of our remaining business districts. Longer range, it'll facilitate the conversion of Arlington to an all bedroom community. This is socially and financially unhealthy for multiple reasons. I've previously described Arlington as a golden gated ghetto. 
This will make Arlington less affordable, not more. The fun, to quote, the fun and vibrant, end quote, street that previous speaker described relies on a host of low wage service sector jobs. Arlington needs better jobs than that and proposals to turn Arlington's main streets into an amusement park for its residents sells the town short. Because of its mix of jobs, Arlington's already becoming a town where those who live here can't afford to work here and those who work here can't afford to live here. This article by facilitating more conversion to dense luxury housing will worsen that. Finally, the annual rate of, Arl of increase in Arlington's municipal budget is excessive by any measure. For years, Arlington has resisted making difficult financial choices. This, the, this attempts to delay the day of reckoning further. Again, I oppose Article 39. There are better ways to develop our real estate than this. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Chris. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street again. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, questioning this assumption that the current FAR is too low. And I think there's been a lot of misinformation about that. The staff memo cites a report by MAPC that suggests that mixed use buildings are effectively limited to two stories. The staff memo itself cites a figure of one and a half to two stories. I would like to ask the board, the ARB, which is the only board in town that can approve mixed use special permits. How many mixed use special permits have you approved that were for one and a half and two story buildings? As far as I know, every one that you have approved is three to four stories. So the idea that the existing zoning bylaw prevents mixed use developments of, of more than two stories is just absolutely false. And everyone needs to understand that. The other thing assumption I'd like to challenge is that the current zoning bylaw is inconsistent with the master plan. I've heard a lot of talk about trying to build buildings, mixed use buildings that were five stories. In fact, the visual survey that was done as part of the master plan indicated that most people did not like five story buildings and at most they wanted them to be four stories. And if you look at the current zoning bylaw, it does in some cases allow buildings up to five stories, but that's not the norm. In most cases, they are limited to three or four stories. And in the B2 zoning district, they are not allowed to be more than four stories ever. So this one size fits all and desire to have five story buildings all around town is not consistent with our current zoning desires. It's not consistent with the description of the current zoning districts. It's particularly inappropriate in the B2 zoning district. And I think that really needs to, uh, needs to be examined. And I would close just by echoing uh, one of the other commenters who said, this is a complicated area and it shouldn't be left to amateurs. You know, as much as I appreciate um, residents putting forward zoning articles or their own articles, this is really something that should become, that should come out of the board acting in its role as the planning board and considered holistically, because certainly I wouldn't disagree that in some areas, particularly in the central business district, some of these FARs could be tweaked, but this one size fits all is really inappropriate considering the distribution of, of the um, various zoning, business zoning districts around town. So I hope the board will not approve this as it's proposed and will not approve it at all this year and take a much uh, closer look at it before doing anything. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other member of the public wishing to speak before we turn it back to the board for questions? All right, uh, seeing none, um, I'd like to just follow up. I had um, asked a question before we move to, to public comment um, over to, to, to Jenny Rate, And I think specifically, David, um, one of the reasons why I asked the question about the um, maximum FAR for the uh, industrial district, districts that we just approved was that when we went through that process, um, there, there was a lot of nuance in coming up with that particular number of three in terms of bonuses based on use and um, other levers that could be used in order to get to that point. So um, Jenny, if you could maybe just give a quick top line 
there, and then um, I'll I'll give a little bit more of my my thought to David. Love it. The the original question was what was the FAR yes. in the industrial <laughs> zones um, that we adopted at town meeting previously, and the answer to that question, of course, is three, as you can see in the zoning bylaw. But the nuance that I wanted to make sure was clear um, to this body um, as well as to people who are listening is that we talked about height. Um, and we talked about subject to amenity requirements as outlined in this section, which are all of the development standards plus exceptions to maximum height regulations in the industrial district, which then talks about if it's over 39 feet or three stories, it's subject to very specific criteria. The standards are outlined here. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but I think that the point is that it's, it's, there's a caveat to both the FAR as well as the height that I just wanted to make sure was clear to the board, of course, or just to remind folks, um, if you're thinking about the FAR that we talked about in relationship to the industrial districts. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, I appreciate it. Um, so one, one question I would have for, David and the and the board and again David I'm not sure if this is something that you're um, interested in perhaps pursuing or thinking about prior to um, you know when we meet to to vote on this on, on April 4th but um, you know hearing some of the the feedback about the, um, the 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 jump and the and the change of the the zoning the FAR um, across the board to to four um, is whether or not you give any approach or any any thought to taking an approach similar to the way that we approach the industrial districts in the same way that we approach parking reduction with the transportation demand management plans in that um, it, it's there are a, a suite of um, a suite of elements that should a developer incorporate within their building whether it's maximizing business use or increasing the um, increasing the amount of affordable percentage of affordable housing beyond inclusionary zoning or streetscape enhancements or renewable energy sources, et cetera, um, that there is um, just a simple um, option for the board to increase the FAR, let's say um, up to, to double what it is today for some of those those types of things. So um, again, I'm not sure if that's something that you've explored or something that you would be willing to explore um, because I, I think it would fit your intent of um, what you have stated, which is to increase the maximum floor hour ratio allowed. Um, but I just wanted to get your thoughts, David, on um, that type of approach. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really worth exploring and I'm, I'm definitely open to that idea. I think, um, you know, there's, there's potentially a lot of complexity and nuance at exactly, you know, what incentives make sense. I think sort of, from my perspective, proposing this article, I was trying to sort of keep it relatively simple and address what I saw as sort of a mismatch between the sort of the, allow, the, the allowed heights and the FAR. Um, and so I think, you know, potentially there's some value in increasing FAR um, without adding additional requirements and then perhaps allowing a further increase uh, with requirements. But I think there, there's a number of avenues and certainly uh, like a density bonus for um, meeting certain goals is definitely something I'm generally in favor of and could make sense here. Great, thank you. So what I'd like to do at this point is just to um, throw it to um, the, the board members again for any any additional questions or requests um, it, because I think that if any you know you you certainly could decide to just keep the um, you know the motion as as submitted and and have us um, vote on on that on April fourth or if there um, are any changes that you would like to 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 make we need to receive that um, prior to to the fourth. And I think we'd like to be able to, to give you some, some good guidance on that if that's something you'd be open to. Um, so Ken, I'll, I'll throw it over to you for any um, thoughts for, for David before we um, conclude on Article 30, 39. Um, that's a good question, Rachel. I, I think some of the stuff you brought up uh, about uh, having more incremental or more uh, 
incentives tied in with the with these bonuses is good. I also t- liked what Steve said. Maybe four is not is the appropriate number all across the board. It's maybe just doubling uh, them from three to two is what may be, may be a, a better a number. I just don't know how we can get there, get there from here. Right. Because today's the 21st and we have the fourth coming up and you have to submit this into us a week before. Is that right, Jenny? So I'm not sure how we're going to get there. Um, I really like your approach. I'm not sure all the numbers are there that I can support right now. So um, uh, let's see what the rest of the board thinks. I mean, I'm not going to, you know, I just don't know how it's all going to work. Great. Thank you, Ken. Jane? Yeah, thank you. Um, we have talked on the board, at least for the last couple of years, that something needed to be done with the FAR in the business districts. And there were many examples that we had. And um, I can think, by the way, of three mixed use buildings that are only two stories high that we have issued special permits for during the time I've been been on the board. Um, And the real problem on Mass Ave and Broadway is that many of the buildings don't have a large lot. They don't have the lot that Mr. Seltzer showed in his presentation. And so we're dealing with something other than what he showed. Um, I like Mr. Revelak's suggestion that the way to do this is really to just double what the current FAR is. I think that would get at what the board had been talking about for some time. Some of the other things that we are bringing or maybe bringing to town meeting this year are some of the other things that you mentioned, Rachel. There will be, I hope, a zoning article to require um, solar on roofs. There will, I hope, be a zoning article, and we need to talk about that later, to do something with what goes on to the first floor of mixed use buildings. So we will be effectively putting together at least part of that package to bring to this town meeting anyhow. Um, You know, when we um, last proposed this in 2019, I was the largest proponent to say if we gave people um, the ability to build up or do a greater floor area ratio, the trade-off should be what uh, Kin suggested is more affordable housing. And I think that is still something we should consider for this, because I think that's the one piece that we discussed that that isn't here that we should discuss um, and see if we can come up with some way to do that. I'd be, you know, I think it would work up to 20%. Um, affordable housing, but I'd be interested in having the staff take a look at that. Thank you, Jean. Melissa? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have too many comments right now specifically. Um, David, I appreciate, you know, your effort to bring this forward. I understand, you know, from a perspective of, you know, vibrancy and liveliness, you know, the idea of adding density kind of makes sense. I think though, from my experience, it has to, you have to really leverage that density and really work with your property owners to see what are the other elements. So I'm a little bit reserved to kind of supporting this in and of itself. Um, Even though I understand what Jane's saying, we have a package somewhat with the other pieces of proposal. I'm a little reserved to, you know, support this entirely at this point. Thanks, Steve. Any questions or um, additional thoughts on potential modifications prior to the fourth? Um, No, I do take um, Mr. Benson's remark about some of the 
parcel, some of the business parcels being small. Um, you know, my favorite fun fact about cap the zoning in the Capitol Theater is that there are 1,100 theater seats, and there is one, under current zoning, there is one parking space required per every four of them. So if you were to actually, there's, I, I, I feel, I could think I could confidently say there is no way that building could be permitted today with today's parking requirements, unless we allowed them to build a really impressive parking podium. Um, and I, I think one of my, you know, as we go forward and, you know, our hundred year old single story commercial buildings are aging, I'm, you know, so my concern is that these properties might be developed, but you, we would lose a significant amount of um, building just to accommodate, you know, what are modern parking requirements, um, you know, which is yet another thing to work on. I, I do like the, I, I also agree with the idea of, you know, turning this into a density bonus, you know, do do have have something in exchange for the higher FAR. Um, it's it's a tight timeline, but um, yeah, it, it is what it is. Thank you. Okay, so I, what I'd like to um, come to some consensus from the from the board because we need to to give David a, a little bit of um, di direction here. Um, would we like him to do some work in terms of? trying to um, create a, a, uh, a revised motion that includes um, incentives or come back to us with, I, I haven't heard a lot of support for four, but there has been some um, gelling around double where, where we are today. Um, and again, not saying, David, that there's an approval <laughs> In the, in the realm of just what we've been talking about, because we won't be obviously debating this in, until the fourth. And I think that, you know, what we've all been discussing is that there is there is some nuance that perhaps, um, whether it's for this town meeting or a future town meeting, we'd certainly love to, to work with you on. Um, in terms of, do, I think that we need to give David some some direction as to which way we would, we would like him to move or perhaps ask him to explore both and come back to us with what he, as the petitioner, would 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 like us to to vote on. Um, so I'll add, I'll just go through one more time and and see if there's um, some uh, consensus we can achieve there. Otherwise, David, I think I would just like you to you know take what you've heard and and synthesize that, and um, you can certainly. Um, you know, ask any any questions um, as we finish as well. So, Ken, um, any any final thoughts here? Well, I would definitely lower it. I would recommend lowering it to maybe double. Yeah, I think you would have a more. We would have a more appetite toward uh, uh, moving that along to uh, uh, a vote. Um, I don't think there's much anything else right now that you can do fast enough and do uh, do adequate enough. There's still other issues, but I think just by doing that is, is enough to get it at least. To have a good discussion? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Jean? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of choices are to double, which Steve had suggested, and leave it as simple as that. Um, or to add on to it, what Kin had suggested, something that increases the amount of affordable housing. I'm just not sure that between now and April, we're gonna be able to land on what should that increase be. That's my one problem. So in some ways, I think the one, and Melissa may sort of not be there on this, but I think what I feel is maybe an emerging consensus is just going with double doubling the existing FAR and leave everything else because we're not ready to go there yet. And it's the sort of smallest incremental change we could make for this. Thanks, Melissa. Any other guidance for um, David? No, not at this point. Thanks, Steve. I'll just reiterate my earlier suggestion, double but no greater than three. Okay. 
David, any uh, final questions for the for the board? Um, no, I want to thank everyone for their time and perspective. I think this has been very educational for me, and I will get you some revised options as soon as possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your time this evening and for the presentation. All right. Uh, so with that, we will now move on to Article 34, uh, zoning law, excuse me, zoning bylaw amendment uh, related to definitions around uh, porches and projections into minimum yards. And I will hand it over at this point to uh, Jenny Wright. Thank you, Rachel. I, I actually don't have anything specific to share from our memo um, for this particular article or the, the next two. Um, okay. So I think probably just best to listen to the petitioner. I did, we, we did suggest some amendments to some of the, uh, what had been initially proposed by the petitioner. And I think it would be helpful to talk about that. But after we hear from, um, well, these are technically the ARBs. So I, I keep thinking of Christian, you're the petitioner, but I know you brought them to us, but we had more time to think them through as staff uh, in our department memo. So I'll, I'll stop referring to you as the petitioner. <laughs> but um, I think since you had proposed the initial language, after giving it a little bit more cons uh, consideration, we have some suggested amendments. So, um, but perhaps, uh, Rachel, it might be helpful if uh, Christian actually does have- Yes, uh, that was my, yes. We'll, so- Yeah, we'll turn it over to Christian. Move on to Christian, okay. Thanks, Jenny. All right, uh, Christian, if you'd like to um, say a few words about Article 34 and we'll, um, you the same uh, opportunity for Article 34 and Article 36 when they're up as well. Hey, thank you so very much. Uh, my name is Christian Klein. I'm a resident 54 Newport Street. Uh, I'm also the current chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I had brought before the board um, several articles uh, which deal with um, items that come before our board regularly and that we would like to uh, recommend to the town that we adjust our zoning bylaws in order to address uh, common questions that come before our board. And so the first of these is this uh, proposed article in regards to porches. So a lot of people, uh, residents in town come before the board because they would like to add what's referred to as a farmer's porch to the front of their house. So a porch that extends the full width of their house. Um, these are very common features all over town. And in most cases, there is a house where their neighbor to the left and the neighbor to the right already have these porches on the front of their house and they come to the board requesting them. And they are currently, they would be built into the front yard setback. And so we do in our bylaws have an existing section that specifically deals with pro um, projections into required yards. And, but they just don't mention the word porch specifically. And so we had wanted to, um, provide a definition for what a porch is and then to include that um, under this section so that uh, it's clear when people are looking to figure out if they can put a porch on the front of their house what the procedure is and so that's the the sole reason for bringing this before the board tonight thank you great thank you christian um before we get to the uh, members of the board for questions i believe that when you um came before us previously and, and we spoke there was a question about whether or not we needed to separately define um porch uh, open porches and enclosed porches so i wanted to see if you had um, given that any any thought um i i have thought about it a little bit and it it's something that we might want to um ask uh, mr champa about as well as to what the, the, the interpretation is. Um, we do in our, so the, the zoning bylaw as it is today has no definition for porch. Um, or so excuse me, it does, but it, it's a very limited definition. And, but there, the document does use the term enclosed porches and it does use unenclosed porches. Um, and I'm not proposing to um, adjust those. Uh, I do think they would be, it would be helpful in the future to add that at those definitions. What I've tried to do is clarify that a porch in and of itself um, has to be at least open on one side, that it's not just a covered area, but it, it's covered, but it has to be at least open on one side. Great, thank you. Uh, all right, at this point, I'd uh, like to uh, go through the members of the board uh, for any questions you might have for either Jenny Wright or Christian Klein. And uh, we'll start with uh, Ken. 
No, I have no questions. Great, thanks. Jean? Yeah, I, you know, and Christian and I had discussed this at some time in the past, but didn't see the wording until recently. I, I don't understand, and I, I need to have you tell me what it means to say open on at least one side as a definition of a porch. Christian? Thank you, yes. So um, when we consider, so there are a lot of porches um, where, you know, a typical porch is attached to the house on one side, has three open sides. Um, there are certainly circumstances where there, the porch is in an L of a house. And so there's building on two sides of it, but so it's open on two sides. And there are lots of situations more sort of with high rise build, not necessarily high rise, but mid rise apartment buildings where a porch will be open only on the front and the two sides will have building on it. Um, and so that's the intent is to indicate that that there, it is not enclosed on one side. So no windows um, on that side, no window, no wall. You know, obviously it will have to have a guardrail. Um, it may have screening, but that it, it is not weatherized in any particular fashion. So I've got a, a neighbor with a porch that is, it has a wall about halfway up on the three sides that aren't, the sides that aren't directly connected to the house and then screens, mm -hmm. you know, on those three sides. So are the three sides that don't have full walls considered open? Um, Christian, yeah. I, I would consider that to be open, yes. Okay. I'm, okay, I, I think if the ZBA is going to end up um, having to do this, you might wanna, if you get the authority to easily amend your rules and regulations to expand upon this and the rules and regulations, maybe with some drawings or something like that to make it a little clearer about um, that, what that is, um, then, um, yeah, that was the only question I had um, about this particular warrant article. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Melissa, any questions uh, for Jenny or Christian? Mm -hmm. um, Christian, just curious how many, um, you know, in a year, how many people come by with this, you know, how, how many, maybe applicants get addressed by this? Christian? Um, so I can, Steve can verify this as well. I think last year we were probably somewhere between eight and a dozen. Mm -hmm. I believe that that sounds about right. Thanks, Madam Chair, was Kelly holding her hand up? Uh, yes, she is. Sorry, I have to scroll way down. Kelly, please. Sorry, no, I just looked through the staff memos to the ZBA just on those cases. Um, you know, typically it's two to four a year, but last year was an outlier. And I think that was because of um, probably delayed applications due to the pandemic and then just an unusual surge. So we hit 11 in Great. 2021. So, um, yeah, but if the language is cleaned up and it helps the ZBA, then I think that makes sense. Thanks. Thank you, Melissa. Steve? Uh, no comment. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so at this point, I'd like to go ahead and uh, open uh, Article 34 up for public comment. Uh, any member of the public wishing to speak about this article, please use the raised hand function. Give it a couple seconds. All right, uh, so seeing no public comment, um, I will just go back through the board to see if there's any final questions. Um, actually, why don't I just ask at this point to see uh, if, you could just use, again, the raise hand if, if you have any final questions. I think we went through everything for this article. Just a quick 
through. All right, so I think at this point, we'll move on from Article 34 to Article 35, which is a zoning bylaw amendment for yard encroachment. Um, and again, Jenny had mentioned that she didn't have anything specific here. So uh, Christian Klein, I will turn this over to you for um, any thoughts that you might want to add related to the uh, yard encroachment article. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so this article um, is sort of brought forth, it relates somewhat tangentially to the prior one. Um, so in town, the current interpretation of the zoning bylaw is that if you have a porch on the front of your house, um, it may be enclosed um, without it being considered an addition because it's already um, it's already considered an enclosed space. And what is what happens when that occurs is that then the, the quote foundation wall of the house, the sort of the forward portion of the foundation is then moved to the front surface of that uh, of that area. And at that point, then the building sort of steps forward. And that sometimes happens within the, the front yard setback. And this is something that um, several other people have tried to address um, with in prior years with uh, with different amendments that have not proceeded um, through town meeting. And so what we basically, what the board, what our board has been doing on these re on requests where people are looking for porches to be constructed in the front yard setback is that we're specifically including conditions that they cannot be enclosed and they cannot be considered the front wall of the house so that it does not cause this, um, this interpretation of bringing the front wall of the house forward because we, we don't feel that that's what the ZB, the, the, the zoning bylaw was intending. Um, and so that is the, the reason for including this language. Um, and I had uh, spoken with, uh, with Kelly Lynam earlier um, in regards to uh, the highlighted um, section in under D. Um, I had included that language because it just, because it is included in A and B as well. Um, and so it was just a, as a repetition of that language. And so, but I, I leave that up to you as to whether or not that is something that, uh, that the board wants to um, consider. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we'll turn it over to Ken for any uh, questions. Nope, I have no questions on this too. Thanks, G. I have no questions, I'm okay with the the staff's proposed deletion of the few words. Great, thank you, Jean. Melissa? No questions at this time, thanks. Great, thank you, and Steve? For a simple concept, it is surprisingly hard to put this one into words. I, I think Mr. Klein and staff have done a great job. No further comments. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see. So at this time, we'll open this up for public comment. Any person wishing to speak, please use the raised hand function. And remind reminder to please introduce yourself by first, last name, and address, and you will have up to three minutes. Uh, so the first speaker tonight will be Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street again. Um, just a couple comments on this. I, I support the intent of it. Um, I am troubled a bit by the proposed change that staff has made. I, I don't think that um, strike texts should be struck as they have. And the reason I say that is the business about um, extending or being within the foundation wall is important for the ZBA and, and for their authority and need to act on a special permit. It relates back to... Um, or is it section 8.1.3 of the, of the bylaw? Because if you, once you start working outside of the foundation, then you get into the question of whether it's a significant, whether you're significantly increasing the nonconformity. So I think that should stay there. And I don't think it's a valid criticism that they're perhaps imposing their own definition of foundation. The bylaw is quite clear that within the bylaw terms can be defined that are not consistent with the state building code. All it says is that if a term is not defined in the zoning bylaw, then the state building code um, definition applies. And indeed, if, if this amounts to a definition, then there's nothing wrong with it. 
I think it further, further strengthens the, the ZBA's hand in, in dealing with enforcement of this section. So I'd recommend leaving it in. But there is one thing I find troubling about this, and it pertains specifically to, to DEX, because if you look at section um, 5.3.9B, um, that ex explicitly allows someone to build a deck within the rear yard setback, say 10 feet. So if I have a conforming lot, I have a 20 um, foot um, setback from my, to my real lot line, I can by right put a 10 foot open deck on that. Now, let's say um, this change comes in under section D as it's written, I could then convert that deck to say a new expansion of my kitchen um, just with a special permit. But if I tried to do that before I put the deck in and just built that um, new kitchen into the rear yard setback, I would need a variance. And I would suggest that the ZBA would be very reluctant to give me that variance and probably shouldn't give it to me. And I'm just concerned that the way this is written, it allows for that kind of incrementalism that, that really is contrary to the intent of the zoning bylaw. And I'm wondering if there's not some, you know, changes that can be made to address that kind of thing. So, um, you know, so you don't get into that situation where potentially either that is allowed or it's allowed as a special permit when it really should have to go, um, you know, over the greater hurdle for getting a variance. And finally, I would just um, make one kind of procedural recommendation or request of, of uh, Mr. Klein, that is, if indeed these articles are things that are supported by the ZBA, I would recommend that they go into the warrant as ZBA articles, not articles under his own name, um, or as um, 10 registered voter articles. Uh, under Chapter 40A, the ZBA right. alone is entitled to submit zoning bylaw changes, and I would encourage them to do so under their own title you know when um, when they agree on changes need changes that need to be made thank you thank you uh and for clarification for everyone uh these were actually um uh inserted at the request of the redevelopment board after discussion with christian klein okay um christian any further uh questions here i don't think that the um board had any concerns with the um with the corrections or, or the amendment, excuse me, uh, proposed by the by the staff. Any anything else on on your end? Um, to, to Mr. Loretti's point, I, I would ask uh, the, the chair if she wouldn't mind asking um, the building inspector about the, the question about um, enclosing a deck if it creates a new nonconformity, whether that would um, I mean that obviously would but as a new nonconformity would require a variance as to whether he has any concerns about this language in regards to that. Uh, we can do. Um, Inspector Champa, uh, if you could uh, answer that question, but any concerns you might have about creating a new nonconformity um, through the language that is proposed? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Mike Champa, Director of Inspectional Services. Um, I, I mean, I think I think that um, once we're we have an online system and we have better uh, connectivity to decisions, and it, it'll be uh, it'll be easier um, for people not to create that loop around for themselves. I, you know, I think that right now it's, you know, it would be, we would have to read every decision at every permit application um, to, you know, to avoid a situation like that. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, I'll just go through the uh, board one more time to see if there are any final questions on Article 35 before we move to Article 34. Starting with Jean. Um, I'm just picking up on what Ms. Loretti said, and it's a question for the building inspector and Mr. Klein, and that is whether the first sentence in D should not say except by special permit, but except by variance. I will, do, who did you want to direct that to? Um, uh, Mr. Champa and Mr. Klein. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Champa to weigh yes, in I first. I think that's what Mr. Loretta was saying. So. 
Uh, I'm sorry, at, at which point? In, 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 the... in, 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 um, in D, which is added, the first sentence, the very end of it says, except by special permit. I'm just wondering whether you think it should say, except by variance. Yeah, certainly if, if enclosed, it would, it would be by variance. Um, I, I think that, um, that, that, you know, uh, for an unenclosed porch, I think that it should be, it should be special permit. I think the people should be allowed to, um, you know, to, to do that, but it, it, you would, but if it's enclosed, you're basically extending the house. You're, um, it, you, even if it's a porch, if it's enclosed, it's part of the house. It's, it's an extension of the Thank you. Uh, Christian Klein. Thank you. Um, I wonder if it would be acceptable after a special permit to add or variance as required. Or, at, or com, uh, you know, special permit or variance as appropriate. You could do that. So Jane, again, as this now has been taken up by the redevelopment board, I think um, if that's something that you feel that we should add to that, that that's something that we should um, review with, um, with with Jenny and Kelly and and ensure that that we think that that doesn't create additional confusion by providing the or. Right. Yeah, I I think Jenny and Kelly and maybe also with Mr. Champ and Mr. Klein. Sure. We want this to be something that works for the building inspector and for the ZBA. Sure. Is that something that um, you would um, be able to perhaps just take uh, follow up following this this meeting this evening and and make sure that we have alignment there prior to uh, our meeting on the fourth? Sure. Great. Great. Um, Melissa, any further questions on this article? Um, no, nope, not at this time. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Uh, no questions, Madam Chair. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, between now and the fourth, uh, it sounds like Jean will follow up with um, uh, Mike Champa, Christian Klein, and Jenny regarding um, potentially adding uh, by special permit or variance as appropriate. Make a note. All right. Uh, that will uh, conclude Article 35. We'll now move to Article 36, which is a zoning bylaw <clears throat> amendment related to large additions. Again, originally uh, proposed by Christian Klein and inserted by the request of the Redevelopment Board. So, Christian, I will uh, turn it over to you for uh, any. Um, any discussion that you would like to uh, have regarding uh, this article? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what we're proposing are a couple of additions at the end of this article. Um, one, so large additions, um, there's two criteria for large additions. It's either 750 square feet or 50% or more of the building's gross floor area. But we, we've never specifically indicated whether it's the greater of or the lesser of. And so we, I have had a couple people uh, contact me trying to get a, a sense as to which is, which is correct. So um, we have always interpreted it the same way. I just, we wanted to include it in the bylaw uh, with this language uh, to make sure it's clear. Um, and then there's been a lot of questions that come before the board about additions that are large, that there's a house, there's an, there's additional work being done on the house that is increasing the gross floor area by more than 750 square feet, but it is not being considered a large addition and it's not coming before the board seeking a special permit under, under this section. And so we had proposed um, putting forward a statement that, excuse me, um, that the clarifying how the determination is made because what the what the building department does is um, because 
there are the, these two exceptions whereby um, an addition that is constructed entirely within the existing foundation walls is not considered um, additional space. And so that does any, so if you have an addition that is a thousand square feet where 500 square feet is within the foundation wall and 500 is outside, it's not considered a large addition, even though it's a thousand square feet. And so we had proposed putting forward that, um, that kind of an addition would be considered um, a large addition. And more what, what we would like to do is have um, the ARB's determination as to what they think is the appropriate action. Um, if that's appropriate, then that's, then that's fine. If they disagree with that, that's fine too. I just think we need to be clear in the bylaw as to um, how this is being calculated. Great, thank you very much. Um, so Ken, I'll start with any, uh, any questions for, um, for uh, Article 36. Uh, Christian, uh, before we talk today, I thought I understood this. Now I'm a little confused. <laughs> I apologize for that. So just really briefly, okay? If an addition is less than 750 square feet, it's not a large, it's not a large addition. But if it's greater than 50% of the, of the foot, gross foot area, right? It's, it, it is, if it's less than that, it's still okay. But if it's greater than that, it's a large addition. Or, and, or is it somewhere in the middle? I, 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 you lost me there. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, so if you have an addition, if, if you're if you have a 1,000 square foot house and you are proposing a, a 600 square foot addition, okay, um, it is not 750 square feet, but it is more than 50 percent of the gross floor area, and it would be the lesser of 750 or 600. So in that case, the 600 would be because it's more than 50 percent the size of the house would be considered a large addition. Subsequently, if you had a 2,000 square foot house. The threshold to be either 750 or a thousand square feet. So the 750 would. Okay. So both a, applies. So both apply. It's just whichever is the, the lesser value of those two. Okay. Sorry. When you said the lesser value, I, that's where you got me all confused. I, I have no other questions. Yeah, I agree with that. Great. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Thanks. I have a question and a comment. Um, the question has to do with the highlighted one at the bottom. I want to make sure that I understand this. So if, no, no, back to where we were before. Thank you. Yes, that highlighted one right there. So if I'm proposing a, an addition to my house, which is more than 750 square feet, but it's all within the existing footprint, Let's say I'm going to put an entire second story on a one story house. That would not be considered a large addition because of the added sentence in the bottom that says the used to determine shall only include additions outside the existing footprint. So if I put a whole second floor on my house, it's not a large addition. Is that right? I'm not I'll turn back to Christian to answer. Yeah, it's for Christian. So Madam Chair, it's the, the second bullet under six. Um, so there, there's the two bullets, so excuse me, the first bullet. So the addition, so because it came with it, um, so it shall be allowed, so it's no alteration shall be allowed unless the addition is constructed entirely within the existing foundation walls. So as the bylaw is written today, any addition that occurs within the foundation wall is not considered towards a large addition. Okay, so if I were to build a second story, it would not be considered a large addition. That is correct. And I would ask the building inspector to verify that, Madam Chair, if you would. Uh, sure, I'll turn it over to Mike Champa to verify his uh, agreement with that statement or disagreement with that statement. No, nope, that's correct. Great. 
So if, if I'm putting the second floor on, and I'm also expanding out the side, it's only the area that's expanding out the side that you're going to count to see if I meet the 750 feet or 50%. And does the 50% include the second story I'm putting on or not? Turn that to Christian. <laughs> I, I, I hate to play past the buck on this, but I would love to, to uh, pass this along to the building inspector. OK, we'll pass this on to Mike Champa. <laughs> It, so a, anything within the foundation going straight up does not count towards this regulation, does not count towards a large addition. So it's only, Gene, what's, what's beyond the, uh, the foundation wall? Right, that wasn't quite the question I was asking. Do you restate it then? If I'm putting a sec, let's say I'm just going to do a um, an extension out of the building, and it's okay. more than seven hundred fifty square feet or fifty percent. Then it's a large addition. But if I'm putting on a second story at the same time, do we count what I'm putting on toward the fifty percent? No. Okay. So I'm. Um, so okay. That answered my question. The, my concern about this, I raised this, I think, when, when Christian came to us last time. I may have raised it at the zoning bylaw working group, but I may have forgotten to raise it at the zoning bylaw working group. I think, and I'm interested from Mike and Christian, does this really even make any sense to have this as long as the addition is not into the setback, it's not violating, you know, the amount of open space you have to have, et cetera, et cetera. Why are we doing this at all? What problem are you solving is yes, what, the question. Yes, thank you. Yes, what problem does this solve? Okay, I'll turn it over to Christian first. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the the reason, so the, for the two separate um, alterations, the first one is just to clarify which of either option A or option B under six, the 750, which of those, which of the larger, so that's all fine. The, the final sentence is to um, put into the zoning bylaw what the current interpretation is from inspectional services as to how this bylaw is to be interpreted. Like that, that I, I misstated my question. My question was what not what do these two things problem solve? This entire bylaw on large additions, what problem is it really solving? Like, why is this even in the zoning bylaw? Why do we care if I put an addition on my house that's more than 750 square feet, if I still have enough open space and, you know, and I'm not in any setback, why, why, do, why do I need to go to the ZBA for that at all? I mean, what problem is this solving? That's a, this is, I think, I, mean, I think we should go ahead with this, but I would like us to come back next year to determine whether this is unnecessary work for the ZBA and really not needed, you know, as long as the, the additions don't violate any dimensional requirements. So I'd like us to review that next year. Sure, right. Okay, we'll, we'll definitely, yep, keep a, Keep a note on that one to come back to, but right, that, I think that's outside of, right, definitely outside of the yeah. scope of what uh, what we're reviewing. It is. Okay, thank you, Gene. Uh, I'll go to Melissa next for any questions. I do not have questions at this point. Great, thank you. Uh, Steve, oh, I I'm sorry, it. before I go to Steve, I see that Jenny has her, nope, okay. No, no, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll wait for Steve, please. Okay, thank I you. Not remembering Steve next. Okay, thank you, Steve. I just had one question. Um, now, I, I I understand that the last sentence in the last paragraph is uh, effectively taking the current interpretation and putting it into the bylaw. That's that's good. It's that's great. It lets people know what to expect. 
Now, as I recall, the original proposed main motion was a little different, um, but based on the staff memo, it sounds like it would possibly have created a significant increase in the workload for the ZBA. And I'd just like uh, to get Mr. Klein's opinion on whether um, he's okay with the uh, changes suggested by staff in that last sentence. Uh, Christian Klein, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Revelak, uh, yes, indeed. So as I had originally proposed it, um, it would include all area uh, within the 750 square foot calculation, which is different from what the inspectional services original um, and current interpretation of the bylaw is. And uh, after speaking with, um, with staff, uh, the recommendation was to make it uh, be the current interpretation from inspectional services. Um, and I have no objection to that. Um, and as you as you note that, that the change would have um, obviously brought many more cases before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And I think the members of the board would be uh, fine not to not to have the additional the additional caseload. And I think we're we're fine. And from my perspective, I'm I'm perfectly fine with it as long as it's clear as to what the intent is. Great, thank you very much. Steve, any other questions before I turn it over to Jenny, you had her hand up. Uh, nothing further, Madam Chair, thank you. Okay, Jenny. Thank you. Um, so I just, the, the, the main thing to point out is this, is this is a special permit process. So it essentially creates a notification to people when something like this, a large addition is happening. And I think that that's one of the primary reasons why it is in the zoning bylaw, um, from what I understand. And from looking at this in 2016, when there was a, a different um, potential amendment to large additions and the special permit process, expanding the level of notification is something that has been discussed previously. And so therefore expanding the number of things that apply to the special permit process. Um, so I just would say that, you know, to Jean's point or to Jean's question, why is this here? I do think that uh, you know there's a there's a process here behind this that is administrative in nature, but it is also notifying abutters when something like this is is happening to you know an abutting property or in the neighborhood, and there's interest, um, but it is not necessarily being done by right. Um, so that that is my understanding of some of the origin of this particular section of the bylaw. I'm sure there's much more to it, but that is that is one piece. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. All right, uh, so at this time, we'd like to open uh, Article 36 up for public comment. Any person wishing to speak, please use the raised hand function. Uh, please uh, make sure to introduce yourself by first, last name, and address, and you will have up to three minutes to address the board. We'll start with Don Seltzer. Thank you, Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I'm a little confused about the definition of alteration versus addition. And I was hoping that Mr. Kahn or Mr. Champa could explain or give an example of an alteration that would come under review. Um, using the example that Mr. Benson just gave of adding an extra floor onto the house where it's clearly within the footprint, um, that doesn't seem to be subject to review. So is there a type of alteration that is not an addition? Uh, if I sound confused, it's because I am. So I'm just hoping that someone could clarify. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christian Klein, I'll turn that question over to you. And if you would like to punt, we can do that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I'll, I will allow the, the building inspector to correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this point, but an alteration is a reconfiguration of existing space and an addition is an increase in the amount of space. Thumbs up. All right. Thank you very much for the clarification. Uh, so our uh, next speaker this evening will be Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, uh, 56 Adam Street. Uh, just a couple points on this. I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear how the bylaw is currently being interpreted, because my understanding was always that you had that 750 foot limit. And if you went outside of the um, existing footprint at all, then the special permit review was triggered. And my understanding is, at least initially when this bylaw 
uh, amendment passed, and it goes way back. That, that's how it was being enforced. So I'm, fr I'm frankly surprised to hear that people are saying that the way it's been, the way it's enforced is only if all, all of you know you're only counting the gross floor area addition outside of the existing footprint. I don't, I don't think that's the way it always was. And I think if you look at the plain language, the way it was originally written, this term about the addition is constructed entirely within the existing foot foundation walls. The clear implication is that if you're adding floor area outside of the walls at all, then you count that plus whatever you've added inside to, to do the test of the 750 square feet. Um, but be that as, a, as an as it may, and to get to, to Mr. Benson's point, I think in most cases, in like a place like East Arlington, wherever this floor area is added, even if you're adding it within the existing foundation walls, you are within a building footprint because there are so many non-conformities with, with respect to the yard setbacks. And, and finally, I would say um, the way this is being changed <clears throat> just further adds to the point I had before, about counting the um, the footprint of porches and the like, either within or outside of the existing building footprint, um, because the previous change that was proposed by staff would make those porches within the, the footprint. So even if you enclosed the porch, added new gross floor area, it wouldn't count towards that 750 square feet with that other change they were making. So that, that's another reason I believe um, you know, for that that other change that was proposed, those porches and the like should be considered uh, to be outside of the original building footprint. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, all right, so I'll just run through the um, the members of the board to see if there's any final uh, commentary before we move on. Starting with Ken. None. No. Jean. None. Uh, Melissa? None. Steve? Nothing here. All right. Thank you very much, Christian. I appreciate you being with us this evening and for answering questions and working with the department on the uh, final wording of these articles. Much appreciated. My pleasure, and thank you to the board. Thank you. All right. At this time, um, I would like to see if there is a motion to continue the public hearing for the Warren Articles for 2022 town meeting to next Monday night, which is uh, March 28th. So motioned. I will second that motion. All right, we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Jean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. And Steve. Yes. And I am a yes as well. All right, we will now continue. Uh, agenda item number one, the Warren Article public hearing for 2022 town meeting to our next Monday night meeting. That moves us to agenda item number two, which is the continued discussion of the special town meeting zoning Warren articles um, that we began discussion on last week. And I will turn this over to uh, Jenny Wright. Jenny, are you back with us? I know that you are moving locations. If not, Kelly, I will turn it over to you. It does not look like Jenny is back. So Kelly, I'll turn this over to, to you. All right. Um, so I just wanted to know, we submitted the warrant, or submitted the legal notice to the advocates so that will be going live on Thursday. Um, this was included with your packet for the agenda tonight. Um, we'll be pulling together the uh, proposed vote language for that in the next few days. Um, I don't know if there were anything, any other comments that the board wished to make regarding the proposed amendments and Jenny's here now, so she can kind of fill in. Jenny, I just let everyone know that we Sorry, so I had submitted the legal rules. notice regarding the, um, the warrant articles for special town meeting. Yes, um, let me share the legal notice, so one moment, please. Okay. Um, so I just, I mostly just wanted to share 
with the board that we, you know, the the um, special town meeting is actually May, I, depending upon whether or not the select board <laughs> voted on this this evening, but I believe it will be May 11th. That is the proposed date. Um, and so we obviously needed to make a deadline uh, for filing the articles. So um, there are three. Um, one of them is the family child care bylaw amendment, um, which, you know, of course, we're going to be preparing the language for. Uh, the same thing goes for signage. Um, I made one change to this one that uh, is slightly new, which is, and this came up in our discussion, which is uh, adding electric vehicle charging stations rather than just shared mobility. I just, I, I thought that was more expansive um, and, and probably, you know, the level of specificity we actually need. Um, and then the last one is this uh, section that uh, was discussed um, with town council uh, with regard to 8.1.3C, um, which in a way sort of relates to some of our last, the prior discussion related to the warrant articles. So it's sort of interesting. Um, and that was really it. I just wanted to make sure that the board knew um, this, this happened. Uh, we were able to uh, get this, uh, the, the legal notice posted. Um, and it will be published on this Thursday, the 24th, as well as, well as the 31st. And we will uh, have a hearing on this um, on April 7th. And, uh, you know, subject to what we can accomplish on April 7th, we may need to have another, potentially add another hearing date, but hopefully we can um, move through these articles on that evening. Um, one sort of sidebar is that on April 25th, we said we would begin at 7 p.m. I am, however, I'm wondering if we might be able to meet up uh, for these hearings to start at 7 p.m. is fine, but we will have a special permit hearing that same night. And so I would like to ask the board separately if we can maybe meet at 6.30 p.m. on the 25th, just due to the fact that town meeting begins at 8 p.m. And I think that that's crushing a lot. Um, into one evening, so. Jenny, just so that I can co confirm, the agenda for that evening will be a special permit um, hearing and uh, voting on the memo for town meeting, correct? Yeah, we'll or, have a report. This, we'll have a special, special town meeting report. Right. Yeah, a separate one. Right. So you have two family child care special permits that will be coming before the board on, and we would like them ideally to come that night, if possible. Okay. Great. Okay. All right. So we'll let's run through, and we'll take any um, two things. We'll ask each one of the the board members. Um, number one, your availability to start at six thirty on uh, April twenty fifth, and um, the second, uh, whether or not you have any questions about the. Uh, the, the legal notice that uh, Jenny shared with us this evening. So we'll start with Ken. Um, both questions are no, I have no issues with starting earlier. I have no questions with uh, legal notice. I do have one question. I'm not sure as you all entertain this, but um, is the town meeting gonna be uh, virtual or are we gonna be in place there? Still don't know the answer to that question, sorry. When, okay. when I know, I will share that information. Will our meeting be virtual or will we will be in a, a meeting? I've, I've done in years past where we had to stop, leave our room and walk across and go into the, uh, <laughs> and, but if we're having a virtually, I, I, I don't think that's gonna happen. So um, we've scheduled these meetings by Zoom, at least in early April, to just sort of continue what we've been doing. Um, but we had decided that we would start meeting again as of April 25th in person. But I think that we also agreed that it's subject to whether or not town meeting is being held virtually because of the issue of sort of <laughs> needing to get to town meeting, which might be physically challenging if it's not in the town hall auditorium. Okay. And so I'm not I'm not 100% sure. I can't answer yet. Sorry. Okay, fair enough. Great, thank you. Good question, Ken. Uh, Jean, any uh, any thoughts on the 6.30 p.m. start on the 25th or the legal notice? So, yeah, let me just check because I got confused. But so 
So we are regularly going to start at seven on the 25th and we'll do 630 instead. That's the proposal, yes. That's the, the, hear, the hearings will start at seven, but if we could meet at 630, we could maybe have at least one of the special permit hearings that night. Yes. I, yeah, I have no problem with that. The, the legal notice looks fine. Thank you for making those changes based on the conversation. You, Jenny, you probably saw that, that Doug and I had some back and forth emails about the Article C. And you and I should probably talk about that. And yeah. I think we might want to ask Christian to weigh in on it. OK, um, yeah. And actually, you're, you're reminding me, Jean, that we added, we, we put in modify or remove right, right. Yes, as, as a result of that correspondence. Yep. Sounds, yeah. I okay. thought that was great. Thank you. Sure. You're welcome. Great. Um, Jenny, and now that you just mentioned that to, to Jean, I just want to make sure that I'm I'm clear on the timing as well. April 7th is when we will have the hearings. April 25th is when we will simply vote. This from the 6:30 is, is simply to to vote on the prepared, not to have a, a hearing, correct? Right. So yes, right. April 7th is the hearing. April 25th okay. is the, April 25th is when we would have a special permit public hearing, not April 7th. Sorry. Yeah, there's two there. We were talking about two different dates there. Okay. We, we don't have time to notice a special permit public hearing for April 7th. So it has to Got be it. April 25th. Okay, great. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for the clarification. Um, Melissa, uh, six, 630 six. start. Does that work for you on the 25th? And any question on the legal notice? Uh, no question on the legal notice, and yes, yeah, 6.30, I can deal. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Steve? So I will have no trouble making a meeting on 6.30 p.m. Monday, um, the 25th, and uh, the legal notice looks fine to me. All right. Sounds good. Anything else, Jenny, that you need from us on agenda item number two? No, that was all. Okay, great. Thank you. In that well, case, we'll, we'll follow up about um, that particular amendment. And if anybody is interested in following up on the others, please feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we'll close agenda item number two and move to agenda item number three, which is open forum. So uh, any member of the public with us this evening who wishes to speak? Please use the raise hand function and you'll be allotted up to three minutes to address the board. Okay, uh, seeing none, I will close uh, open forum. And uh, that brings us to the end of our meeting. So uh, don't believe that there's any new business. So if there's a motion to adjourn, I'd love to hear that. So motioned. Fantastic. Uh, is there a second? A second. Fantastic. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote, starting with Ken. Yes. Dean. Yes. Melissa. Yes. Keith. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So thank you, everyone. We will see you back next week. Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.